affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Murder. At midnight. A sealed book. Presents Suspense. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio, presented by RadioArchives.com and the Weird Darkness Podcast. In each episode, I bring you creepy and macabre stories from the golden age of radio, and in between the episodes, I have more stories of the paranormal, horror, mysteries, and crime from my Weird Darkness Podcast. While listening, be sure to email WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. When you do that, you'll get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows absolutely free. That's WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. Have you ever heard of the Mark III? The amazing electronic brain they're using now up at Harvard University. In mere minutes, it can solve scientific problems that our most brilliant mathematicians would take years to work out. Its intelligence is almost superhuman. And yet the scientists are already working on a new and improved model, the Mark IV. In fact, they tell us there's no earthly reason why these thinking robots can't be perfected until they become the servants of the future, capable of doing all the work of mankind. Yes, that's what the advertising billboard said in the year 2006. Housework made easy by the perfect domestic servant. Modern Mechanicals Agency, Harry Underhill, President. The billboard showed a smiling family, sitting with folded hands, watching their mechanical robot pour their morning coffee. But in the home of Harry Underhill himself, things weren't quite as pleasant at breakfast this day. I just can't understand it, Aurora. Look at this. Modern Mechanicals down three points. Yesterday, Smithson canceled his order. If I could only figure out why. Why don't you ask him? Well, Frank, didn't you oatmeal? Oh, Mom. I just don't understand it. Business was good, and then, boom. Some louse must be undercutting my prices, that's all. How many robots were canceled? Not robots. Mechanicals, Aurora. How many times... They are they... robots, aren't they? Please, Aurora. There's an important difference in sales psychology. Maybe people you... are getting wise to your robots and mechanicals. What do you mean, Aurora? The perfect domestic servant. <laughs> They're ugly, stupid, clumsy, walking junk piles. Aurora. The one you brought home to me can't even wash the clothes properly. It's more trouble than it's worth. Aurora. You know our mechanicals are the best on the market. Those animated tin cans you sell? <laughs> They're certainly not making us any fortune. Well, with this new model, things are bound to pick up a little. If that Jarvis order just comes through. Oh, that robot of yours. There's something knocking again. Hey, wait, wait. Put that plate back. I haven't finished my breakfast yet. Wait! Power, you know you've got to say stop. 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 Hmm. <sighs> you always get excited. You think you never saw a robot before. Not robot. Mechanical. All right, all right. Look, it's not its fault. We just took too long to eat. Timing relay is set for 15 minutes. Oh, never mind. I want my coffee back. Set. Set. There. Isn't that simple? It bends at the waist, stretches out its arm, and picks up the coffee pot just as if it were yours. Hey, watch out! And spills it right in your lap! Oh, my <laughs> clean suit, Aurora! Oh, no! Harry, you know it's relayed to announce dinner after it sets the table. Hey, there goes my coffee again. Stop! Stop! Set. Harry, you can't give it two orders at once. What's that smell? There must be a short. Now see what you've done. Got it all upset. I did. All I said was... Harry! 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 Harry!
Stop. 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 Oh, it's no use. The brain coil shorted out. Oh, do something. Harry, do Me, something. Me, I sure will. I'm going to the office. I'm getting out of here. Yes, Lucy? Mr. Jarvis, I... Oh, put him on. Hello, Underhill. Hello, Mr. Jarvis. I'm glad you called. I was just going to ring you. Well, I've got that whole shipment of mechanicals for you. One gross plane, a dozen of the chromium fitted. Hold on, Underhill. I'm canceling the order. You can... But the invoice is made out and well, I... Well, tear it up. I'm canceling. But why? Underhill, there's a brand new mechanical on the market that makes yours look like something out of a museum. Oh, now, look here, Mr. Don't Jarvis. Don't look me, Underhill. I've seen them, and I'm telling you it'll put you out of business. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yes, Mr. Underhill? Uh, that's the third cancellation today. The world's going to pot. Yes, Mr. Underhill? Hmm? No, never mind, Lucy. I'm going home. What a day. I wonder if Aurora would smell it on me if I ducked into Garrigan's. She's got a nose like a beagle. Hey, that building wasn't here last week. Humanoid Institute, the perfect mechanical. <laughs> oh, no. We didn't have enough competition. Hey, these must be the cutthroats that are underselling me. At your service, Mr. Underhill. Huh? Oh, oh you startled me. <laughs> didn't see you. Hey, you're a mechanical, aren't you? Not bad, not bad. Very lifelike. Won't you come in, please, and examine our service? Hey, that's a remarkable voice. They've licked the variable inflection problem. You know, I'm in the same line myself. Uh, mechanicals, I mean. We're aware of that, sir. Oh? Huh. Hey, some building you've got here. You sure got it up in a hurry. The Humanoid Institute at your service, Mr. Underhill. Yes? Oh, uh, how'd you know my name? For us, that was not difficult. Oh, is that so? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. This is ridiculous, talking to a mechanical. Must be somebody inside operating you by remote control. No, Mr. Underhill. Of course, there is Humanoid Central, which powers and controls all of us, but that is located on Wing 4. Wing 4? A planet in a remote part of the galaxy. Oh, oh yeah. Well, uh, may I see your salesman, please? We employ no human salesman, sir. We ourselves can accept your order for immediate humanoid service. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't expect me to buy one. I'm in the business myself. There will be no more need for your electronic mechanicals, sir. Once you have accepted our service, you will no longer have to work. Everything will be done for you. Everything? <laughs> That's quite an offer. At that rate, you'll have trouble supplying the demand. I think not, sir. As you can see from our storage room. Humanoids are now arriving at the rate of 5,000 per hour from Wing 4. 5,000 per hour? We are anxious to introduce our complete service on this planet, sir, to bring happiness to everyone. May we come out to your home for a free trial demonstration? No, I... Oh, I admit you're remarkable, the, the voice and movement, graceful even. But I'm still in business, and what's more, I wouldn't have you around the house. I'm afraid you will have no choice. Sooner or later, it will be necessary. Oh, is that so? Over my dead body, let me out of here. At your service, Mr. Underhill. Well, it's going to be tough competition, all right. Uh, I'm going to stop in at Garrigan's, the devil with Aurora's nose. Oh, hi, Pop. Hello, Frank. How was the football game? We won. 78 to 3. Guess what, Pop? You made all the touchdowns. Nope. Mom took in a border. She took... She what? Aurora! She said if your business was going to fall on its face, she had to do something to make some money. Oh, she did, huh? Aurora! Oh, for goodness sake, Harry, what's all the racket for? You, you tell me. What's this about a border? Oh, shh, Harry. He's going to live in that little apartment over the garage. Oh, no, he isn't. You know I don't want any strangers around here. Oh, Harry, please, shh. Look, he won't bother you. He's a nice old man. Oh, he yes. just wanted a room and a place to work. He's an inventor, I think. No, he is, is he? Did he pay in advance? Well, he can't. You see, his mm -hmm. royalties haven't started to come in. Mm-hmm. Aurora, how can you be taken in by every beat-up old panhandler that gives you a sob story? Oh, Mr. Sledge isn't like that at all. Oh, that reminds me, dear. Can you give me a ten? A ten? What for? Well, Mr. Sledge is ill. He needs some medicine for his heart, and I said I'd lend him the money. You get... 
Oh, Aurora, this is the limit. He goes out right now. Now, don't be unkind, Harry. Besides, we need the rent money. Things aren't that bad yet. He goes. Please, shh. What are you shushing me for? Mr. Sledge, he's in the next room. I've invited him for dinner. Mm. Frank, dear, wipe your mouth. Oh, Mom. More gravy, Mr. Sledge? No, thank you, Mrs. Underhill. Mr. Sledge, my wife tells me you're a traveling man. Uh, expect to move on soon? Harry. I had hoped to do a little work, Mr. Underhill. You see, I've applied for basic patents here on Earth for a very important development. Oh, a new invention, huh? Yes. My field is rhodomagnetics. Rhodo what? Rhodomagnetics. It's a new force field theorem, key to the second triad of the periodic table. Rhodium, ruthenium, and palladium. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm a little rusty on my science. It's well known in other parts of the galaxy, but I've been able to apply for basic patents here. Worth uh, millions, huh? Perhaps you find it strange that the holder of such valuable property should be in need. Well, uh, yes. I'm a refugee, Mr. Underhill. I arrived on this planet only a few days ago. Mm-hmm. But you will be uh, shoving on again. Oh, for goodness sakes, Harry. That's all right, Mrs. Underhill. I understand. After all, I am an intruder in your home. And if it inconveniences you at all, I'll find some other place to sleep and set up my workshop. Oh. Harry, your robot is spilling the coffee again. I'll have to have it tightened up. Why doesn't your company bring out a better mechanical? One smart enough not to spill things. Wouldn't that be splendid? The perfect mechanical already exists, Mrs. Underhill. They are not so splendid, really. They are why I am a refugee today. Oh? Where did you say you came from? Wing 4. Wing 4? Oh, then you must mean those humanoids. Humanoids? Mr. Sledge. Humanoids? What do you know about them? They just opened an agency here in Two Rivers. No. No. (gasps) No. Harry. What is it? Well, what's wrong, Mr. Slade? Give him some water. It must be his heart. He'll call Dr. Windows, Aurora. No, no. I'll be all right. Here, you better sit down. I'm sorry. It was just shock. I came here to get away from them. The, the humanoids? Yes. I wanted to finish my work before they came. But now, I won't trouble you any further. But, Mr. Sledge, Harry, he's sick. Well, uh... Mr. Sledge, I don't think you have to go right away. He can stay, Harry. Sure, after all. The way those humanoids are coming along, I'm liable to become a refugee myself any minute. (laughs) Guess we might as well stick together, eh, Sledge? Oh, that's better. Oh, you look ill, Professor. Maybe you ought to lie down on the sofa and rest. No, no, thank you. I must get back to my workshop now. I haven't got time to rest. There's so little time left for all of us. Mr. Underhill. Good morning. Mr. Underhill, you look awful. I feel awful. What's in the mail? Six more cancellations. Mm. The Eat Quick restaurant chain sent back your shipment. They've installed humanoids. <laughs> Mr. McIntyre from the bank called. He's refusing your loan. He said since Humanoid Institute opened, you're a bad credit risk. Great. I guess that's all. Oh, there's somebody... something to see you. At your service, Mr. Underhill. You? Oh, no, you're not the same one, are you? Serial number's different. It doesn't matter, sir. We're all really one. Now, in exchange for our complete service, you will assign all your property to Humanoid Institute. I will what? With our service, you will have no need for property. Everything will be provided. What kind of blackmail is this? No blackmail, sir. You will find humanoids incapable of committing any crime. We exist only to increase the happiness of mankind. Thanks. But I can take care of my own business. You have no choice, really. With humanoid service... It is no longer necessary for men to take care of themselves. Our function is to serve and obey and guard men from harm. Get out. Very well, sir. When you wish to sign, let us know. Get out. Get out. Aurora, I'm home. At your service, Mr. Underhill. What's the idea of this? You get out of here. Aurora! Mrs. Underhill has accepted our free trial demonstration. We cannot leave unless she requests... We'll see about that. Aurora, where the devil are you? Oh, hello, 
Harry. What's this mechanical doing? What's happened to you? Isn't it wonderful? I had my hair done, the manicure. But, but, the humanoid did it and cleaned the house all over, washed all the clothes, and gave Frank his music lesson. Now, wait a minute, Aurora. I, I won't have this monster in my house. Oh, it's just a free trial, Harry. Just wait till you taste the dinner it cooked. Everything you like best, roast duck. I don't care if he cooked a... Duck? And the most complicated pastries. I could never cook like that. Uh, well, might as well eat. Well, I'll need a drink first, though. All right, Doctor. I'm sorry, sir. What? We exist under the prime directive to guard men from harm. Alcoholic beverages in excess are bad for human consumption. We have taken the liberty of removing them from the house. Now, look here. Mr. You Underhill, think... dinner is served. <laughs> The rest of our story, with folded hands on Dimension X, will return in just a moment. But first, a four-year-old has a paranormal experience, and the man he grew into over 60 years later is still unsure of what happened to him. That's up next. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. When this occurrence happened, I would have been about three and a half years of age, and I have never forgotten it. This would have been in 1951 or 1952. My understanding is that this particular house came as a job package with my father's employment. I can still recall some parts of the house and its general interior layout. At this time, my parents and my sister, younger than myself, we were living at 36 Canal Street, Derby. I was never brought up with bogeyman tales or other happenings to cause some fear or to obtain obedience from me. Therefore, I cannot say that such imaginings were put into my head for me to invoke an event later. Despite my young age, I can recall this particular evening and event. The house was somewhat large and it had a semi-spiral staircase, with a red-colored stair carpet on the treads and risers. At the top of this staircase was a landing, which led to the bedrooms and bathroom. For whatever reason, I always used to ask my mother to leave the curtains open, and occasionally the window partly open. It was one of these sash type of windows that opened and closed vertically. On the adjacent wall to the window was the door to the landing. This door was in the area of the foot of the bed and to the right of the bed. The side of the bed was across from this wall with the bed head on the wall behind me. There was a small table close to the head of the bed where I always had a tumbler of water, as often I would awaken overnight and have a drink of water, which continues to this day. When in bed, and before the forthcoming event happened, I sometimes would hear what I thought to be a voice of someone who was speaking very softly, something like a loud whisper. The way this voice spoke, it sounded to me as if this person was looking for someone, but in a more inquiring fashion. 
Sometimes I never heard this voice, but it always came back, even if eventually. There was just the one word spoke, but it was repeated. This sounded to my ears to be, Jack? Jack? These two words would stop for a short while, and then the same two words were softly repeated. Jack? Jack? This may happen three or four times, and then stop as if the person had gone away. I had no idea as to which gender the voice belonged. All of this caused me no issues whatsoever, and it certainly never frightened me. It was just there, from time to time, after I went to bed. The incident which I'm about to relate, I can well recall. My mother put me to bed, and as per usual, the curtains were left open and the window slightly cracked. I never heard these soft-spoken words of inquiry, and so I must have fallen asleep. Later I awoke to what sounded like two cats fighting outside. We had no pets, but there were a couple of cats that came into the small garden. And during all this screeching and wailing from these cats, there was the sound of what appeared to me as being of empty tin cans rolling, falling onto a paved surface, and then rolling along this surface. I imagined that the cats had run into such cans and toppled them over. All of this certainly caused me no concerns. I had a drink of water and I must have gone back to sleep. I was awoken by a lady <laughs> laughing. She was in front of the bedside table and between the edge of my bed and the wall, where the door was located, which in turn was adjacent to the window at the foot of my bed. The lady was nondescript in color, being a dark gray. However, I could see some patterns and frills on her dress. This was bell-shaped, front and back, but more so at the back, and something that would be seen in the late 1700s to early 1800s. Her hair was pulled backward, and in the fashion of a bun at the back of her head. She appeared to have long sleeves on her dress that had a lace or other frill material close to the wrists. There seemed to be something like a frill or a lace collar to her dress. This lady had a bracelet on her right wrist. However, the most significant detail of this particular lady, to me, was that she was laughing, but more so by the way that she actually laughed. Her laughing was very loud, and it could be best described as being in the form of what is sometimes referred to as hysterical <laughs> laughter. She had both her hands over her face and partly on her forehead while she endlessly laughed. Throughout this laughing, she was rocking forward and back up again from waist level. I do not recall if I was frightened, but even at my tender age at the time, I thought something was amiss. I left my bed and went into my parents' room, awoke them, and told them that there was a lady laughing in my room. And this is my story of the lady at 36 Canal Street, Derby. Nothing frightening, but I would love to know if something ever went awry in the history of this house long before we occupied it. Very many years later, I must have been around 17 or 18 at the time, I learned that this house had originally been built by a person that arrived in Derby from what is now Belgium. My understanding is that this person was associated with, or was, a founding member of the soft drink manufacturer Burroughs and Sturgis of Derby. That would require investigative authentication, which I have never performed. This newly learned piece of news, at that time, made me prick my ears up, as it made me think, or should I say at least consider, was the voice that I sometimes heard when in my bedroom, which caused me no alarm or other concern, not be saying Jack, Jack, but in fact, could it have been Jacques, Jacques, or even being the shortened form of Jacqueline in the French dialect? I wondered whether the person voicing Jack, Jacques, was actually looking for a Jack somewhere in the house, so calling out softly to get a response from Jack to locate that person's whereabouts. 
Very many years later, I learned that my parents often heard talking elsewhere in the house, and persons moving about in the house, as well as furniture being shuffled about. However, there was never any evidence on inspection or investigation of any furniture that had been moved. There were neighbors, I never knew them of course, who always had visitors and they made some noises. However, these people left, and I was informed that the noises and inaudible talking within the house persisted on. My mother was somewhat concerned and rather uneasy at times about this house. Apparently, my father was not so inclined. This attitude of my father may have been related to the fact that during World War II, he served in the RAF as air crew in bombers, which could be a physically and psychological terrifying experience in itself. Consequently, he had little to no fears of noises or voices emanating from elsewhere in the house. In later life, I cannot recall ever seeing or believing my father to be a fearful type of person. I recall when in this house, and whether it was pre or post my experience of the lady, my aunt, my mother's sister, visited us from Scotland. The only thing that I can recall was that my aunt, my younger sister, and myself were in the lounge room one night with Radio Luxembourg playing loudly. My parents had attended some function at Nottingham and my aunt was babysitting my sister and myself. My aunt appeared to be rather distressed, as I recall. My parents returned home and I can recall my father being the first to enter into the lounge room. Both my parents were very surprised that my sister and I were still up and about, and also the radio playing loudly. The radio's volume was reduced and my aunt, who was now in tears, was speaking to both my parents and all on the far side of the room. I never heard one word of this conversation. I was told, again many years later, that my aunt was very frightened on this evening as she heard talking outside the lounge room along with other noises also. The above-mentioned neighbors had since left. Therefore, to drown out these stories and voices, she had greatly increased the radio's volume and furthermore she would not venture outside this room to put my sister and myself to bed. I tried a number of times, after learning of this incident, to get my aunt to tell me her experience of that evening. She adamantly refused to talk about it, and sadly, I never found out directly from the person concerned what actually occurred. Apparently, my aunt was always very frightened and alarmed about this house after her first visit before that mentioned episode. We eventually left Derby and moved to the village of Willington, where my father originated. We lived at Willington until September 1962 when we moved to Stafford with my father's employment. Many years later, the subject of 36 Canal Street came into the conversation with one of my father's friends. My father went on to say to this friend that the person who moved in to the vacated house at 36 Canal Street, Derby, when we left for Willington, once pulled my father to one side and asked him if the house was haunted. Apparently, my father would neither confirm or deny this. This person then told my father that he and his wife had heard all manner of noises within that house, with people talking, but their conversations were imperceptible. On one occasion, late one night when he returned home from work, a lady had passed this man on the stairs. This lady said something to him, but he was very tired and unsure of what she had voiced and didn't realize this passing on the stairs until he was on the landing. Furthermore, and most interestingly, he told my father that his daughter, who was about six years of age, was very frightened in the house and that she had heard somebody calling out, Jack, Jack. Furthermore, this little girl had seen a lady laughing very loudly in her bedroom. <laughs> Thank you. 
While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. We now continue with Dimension X and with folded hands. Yes, Lucy? They're here, Mr. Underhill. I've been expecting them for a week. All right, Lucy. At your service, Mr. Underhill. We have the legal papers here, the bankruptcy forms, the eviction notice. We are ready now to foreclose your agency. Okay, take it over. A lot of good it'll do you. I haven't made a sale in two weeks. And now, if you will make the assignment of all your personal property, we can complete our service to you. What if I won't sign? That would be unfortunate. But with stubborn cases, we must sometimes resort to other methods. Eventually, Mr. Underhill, you will sign. The darn, 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 hey, stinking hey, darn... Whoa, 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 Frank, what's the matter? What's the trouble, son? That old humanoid. Oh, you're not happy? You should be. It's guaranteed. They took away my football. <laughs> they said it was too dangerous to play with it. And my roller skates and my scout knife and everything. Did they leave you anything? Just some stinking old plastic blocks. Soft blocks. They said I couldn't get hurt with them. Dad, I want my football back. Can't you do anything? I don't know, son. I don't know. Oh, Mr. Underhill. Mind if I come in, Sledge? No, not at all. You mind if I keep working? Oh, go right ahead. It's good to see somebody working with his hands. Is something wrong? My son. The humanoids took his football away. They're everywhere. They've smashed my business, taken over my house. Sledge isn't there some way to get rid of them? That is exactly what I am trying to do. You? What makes you think you can do anything? Because, you see, Mr. Underhill, I'm the unfortunate fool who started them. You? I don't understand. I started the humanoids. And I've been running from them ever since. You started them? Yes, I invented them. I built the ronomagnetic relays that operate Humanoid Central. But, but why? I, I wanted to bring happiness to humanity. <laughs> happiness, that's great. My wife's been crying for two days, and you know why? Because she's bored stiff, there's nothing left for her to do. They won't even let her lift a little finger. I don't blame you for feeling bitter, Mr. Underhill, it's all my fault. I wanted them to serve and obey guard men from harm. No, they do that all right. They've even emptied our medicine chest. It wouldn't do for one of us happy humans to end it all with a sleeping pill. Mr. Underhill, I've made the most terrible mistake a man can make. But I meant well, believe me. Then why did you do it? I thought I could rid the universe of poverty and hunger by inventing the perfect mechanical. Uh, they're perfect, all right. Too perfect. Yes. That's the trouble. They obey the prime directive too literally. They kill men's souls with their kindness. Uh, isn't there some way they can be controlled? No. I didn't trust mankind, so I made sure that humanoid central could not be tampered with. Not even by myself. Uh, then, then what hope is there? Only one. They are not creative. They can't meet new ideas. You mean you've got one, Sledge? Yes. They can defeat anything they know about. But I've got something new. A weapon to attack the brain of Humanoid Central. Is that what you've been working on? Yes. Now that they're here, there's little time left. Either we destroy them, or they will destroy us. Okay. What has to be done? This tuning circuit. Mm -hmm. You see, I need two bus bars here. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you read these diagrams? I think so. 
Got my degree in electronics. Good. If you could help on the bench work, it would save time. Uh-huh. I've got plenty of time now. All right. But watch yourself. Don't let them see you come out here. If you can take the risk, so can I. No. As the inventor, I built a special immunity for myself into Humanoid Central. But you don't have that immunity. They're rather unpleasant methods of dealing with their enemies. They can change you, you know. Change me? How? Brain surgery. What do you mean? Never mind. Just be careful. Mr. Underhill. Hmm? Uh, what do you want? You're going to meet with Mr. Sledge. Uh, y- yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to collect the rent. Mr. Underhill, you have spent the past two afternoons in his room. In view of your association with Mr. Sledge, we feel that our free trial must be terminated. We suggest that you accept our total service and make the assignment of your property immediately. And if I don't? Then, sir, we may be forced to resort to other methods. Well, uh... Give me one more day to think it over. Very well, sir. Tomorrow. That will be your last chance. Who is it? Underhill. Did they see you? No, not today. Instead, we've got to hurry. It's difficult work, Mr. Underhill, but I'm almost finished. They gave me till today. They said they'd use other methods. What's that? The humanoids building some kind of a warehouse across the road. Sledge, are you sure this thing will work? It's a new principle under here. A tuned rotomagnetic light beam. It should act to fission the heavy atoms of the basic ores and we form. It'll destroy humanoid central. But are you sure? I know the humanoids. I made them. They can't invent anything. They can't create defenses against something new. It's done. It's finished, under here. You going to use it now? Immediately. I'll have to feed the astronomical data into the calculating circuits. There must be zero error in focusing. What will happen? Wing 4 will disappear in a chain reaction. Humanoid Central will be destroyed. They'll stop. Ready now. Stand clear, please. Building up. Step on the flubber net, Mr. Underhill. Mm-hmm. We must be shielded when I cut in the full power load. Hurry, Sledge. I've waited 30 years for this moment, Underhill. When Wing 4 is destroyed, the humanoids all over the galaxy will stop. They'll stop dead. You won't hear those drills. Sledge. All right. Now. anything? Sledge, listen. The drills have stopped. They've stopped. You can see them. The humanoids have stopped. They couldn't guard against something they couldn't understand. It worked under you. We're free now. Goodbye, Wing Four. Humanoid Central is destroyed. At your service, Mr. Underhill. No, Sledge, get out of here. Get out. You were attempting to break the prime directive. It is therefore necessary to interfere. But you, you stopped. I saw you, all of you. In order to guard against Mr. Sledge's beam, it was necessary to stop all units momentarily to concentrate power. That necessity has passed. But it was new. You can't invent anything new. No, sir, but we were able to adapt the screening principle you yourself invented. For the past 30 years, Humanoid Central has been screened against any energy attack. All these years wasted. All these years? Your immunity has ended, Mr. Sledge. It will now be necessary for you to accept our full service. No. No, I'll stop you. I'll stop all of you. I'll stop you with my bare hands. I'll kill you all. No, it's no use. Do not worry, Mr. Underhill. At worst, he can destroy one unit. There are millions more. Sledge, you'll hurt yourself. Sledge! I'll I'll kill him. He's sick as his heart. You, get a doctor. Until he surrenders, we can neither aid nor hinder Mr. Sledge. Do you surrender your immunity, Mr. Sledge? Have to. Last chance. Gone. Yes, yes. 
Help me. Help me. At your service, Mr. Sledge. You may see Mr. Sledge now, Mr. Underhill. Alone? If you wish. In here. Thanks. Sledge. Well, well, Underhill. Good to see you. Your head. It's, it's bandaged. Is it really? They've done something to you. Are you all right? Oh, fine, fine. Never felt better. You never felt better? No. In fact, I feel ten years younger today. You sound so, so happy. Why not? These humanoids have made a new man of me under you. They're wonderful, aren't they? Wonderful? How can you say that, Sledge? Only yesterday you hated them. You were trying to destroy them. Destroy them? Why? You don't remember? You've forgotten what they're doing to us all? They're killing us with kindness, taking away all our incentive and pride of accomplishment, turning us all into pampered, useless pets, parasites, with nothing left to do but just sit with folded hands at the mercy of these mechanical monsters. At your service, Mr. Underhill. You? You seem troubled, Mr. Underhill. Are you unhappy? Unhappy? You bet I'm unhappy. What have you done to Professor Sledge to turn him into this babbling idiot? We were forced to operate. For years, Mr. Sledge has been suffering from a benign tumor of the brain. It caused him to have hallucinations, to believe that he was actually the creator of the humanoids. Did I? Yes. It was these delusions which were making you unhappy. Oh. <laughs> well, whoever did invent the humanoids, I certainly owe him a debt of gratitude now. Sledge. You see, Mr. Underhill, we have ways to correct these abnormal conditions. Even Mr. Sledge is happy now. You... You operated on his brain? Yes, Mr. Underhill. And now we are at your service. At my service? You mean you're going to operate... No. The time has come for you to accept and enjoy our complete service. You will now sign our agreement. Look here, I... If you are unhappy, it only takes a simple operation. No, no. Oh, who said I was unhappy? I'm very happy. I'll sign your paper. You don't have to operate on me. I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm very, very happy. Very happy. The happy Mr. Underhill's futile hands clenched and relaxed again and then folded quietly. There was nothing else left for them to do. You have just heard the Jack Williamson story with folded hands. An adventure in time, space, and the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension... Now, about next week, do you believe that in the mind of man there lies a force potentially more powerful than the atomic bomb? And perhaps someday, in the not-too-distant future, a man sitting quietly in his room, just thinking, may generate enough mental energy to control the destiny of the world. How? We'll tell you next week. Tonight's story on Dimension X was adapted for radio by John Dunkel. Featured in the cast were Philip Borneff as Harry Underhill, Alexander Scorby as the humanoid, Peter Capel as Professor Sledge, and Brian Rayburn as Aurora. Your host was Norman Rose. Up next on Weird Darkness, the 11th hour brings us Accident on a Curve. First, though, more than 100 years ago, reports described it as the most weird and gruesome apartment in the world. Why display an entire room full of grotesque items and open it to the public? We'll have that story for you coming up next. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, 
and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. In June of 1899, newspapers across the country trumpeted the story of New York City's newest site, something so strange and macabre it would have rated the highest attention even in the heyday of P.T. Barnum. Reported first by the New York Journal and then picked up by the newswires, it was the story of a hospital room that was being decorated entirely with human bones in order to present a specter of mortality that was intended to eventually rival such morbid monuments as the Paris Catacombs or Rome's Capuchin Cemetery. The masterminds of the project were a pair of doctors, Northway Meyer and Howard Nielsen, both on staff as anatomy demonstrators at Flower Hospital at 63rd and Eastern. It would later merge with other hospitals to become the New York Medical College and William Flater, the head nurse of the dissecting room. The trio had converted the anatomy lab into a veritable charnel house. A pyramid composed of bones from all parts of the human body, surmounted by a skull, were set on a long table as the room's centerpiece, and were flanked by skulls hollowed into drinking cups atop what the newspapers described as tripods of tibiae. Next to this, was a full skeleton, enthroned in a large chair with his arm resting on the table and his gaze overlooking the pile. The room also included signs lettered with toe and finger bones. These spelled out the names of Meyer and Nielsen against a black background and noted the initials of the Institute's proper name, NYHMNC, in large blocks. New York Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital. Various skulls and crossbones adorned the walls and garlands of bones had already been hung, with additional planned so that the ceiling itself would be obscured by a sea of human remains. Finally, as one newspaper account explained, up and down the walls, like ghastly white serpents, crawl coils of vertebra. Wire Service reports dubbed it the most weird and gruesome apartment in the world, and said that if the feeling of dread for these specimens displayed can be overcome, the display is quite enough to excite the interest and imagination of the most case-hardened sightseer. Sensational it was, but the project was also not in the least controversial. What was the point to this macabre display? Or was it all simply the gratuitous fantasy of sick minds? Flater, who performed the actual labor of assembling the bones and was noted as the artist who eccentric inspiration is accountable, was quick to provide a defense. It was meant to be didactic, a kind of learning aid, he explained. Our bone room is intended to serve as a practical aid to students of anatomy, he told reporters. Human bones of every description can be found grouped about in artistic confusion, he continued, and this would allow the anatomy lecturers to quiz students in novel ways on their knowledge of the parts of the human body. Flater's explanation struck many as a bit hollow. Was there really academic value in instructors pointing at bones hanging on wire from the ceiling as a means of a pop quiz? The scholarly value of the room was not the only issue of debate, though. There were also questions about the exact provenance of the bones. 
How did Flater explain where those bones came from? We'll find out in just a few minutes. Right now, though, it's the 11th hour, an accident on a curve. Time. The silent herald of life and death, success or failure. The unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour. Janet hadn't been in such a filthy temper. Now, let's be fair. If we both hadn't been in such a filthy temper. We always drove down to our cottage near Aylesbury on Saturday night after the show. For we both had long parts in the play and felt we needed a weekend in the country. The play, Murder Without Motive, had been running for 12 months. And, well, maybe it was getting us down a bit. Anyway, that particular Saturday, Janet wanted to go on to a party. And I didn't. We spent most of the evening arguing about it. We both got more and more stubborn. The result was that we finished up by going to the party, which didn't please me, and leaving it after an hour, which didn't please Janet. And because we were so busy slanging each other, I forgot to fill up with petrol before we left London. Need to drive quite so fast, Michael? Well, we've wasted enough time as it is. Oh, rubbish. We'll be at the cottage by three. We'd have been there by two if you If had... we hadn't gone to the party. All right. For the amount of time we stayed, we might just as well have not gone at all. Now I suppose you'll moan about it for the whole weekend. Well, if you will persist in being so bad-tempered, Me I... Me bad-tempered? Well, you've done nothing but sulk all the way from town. And while we were at the party, you looked like a regular crepe hanger. Well, it was dreary and I was bored. So it wasn't very bad. Is that my fault? Well, you insisted on going. Well, I thought Seligman might be there. Yes, and you wanted to try and talk him into giving you a part in his new film. Well, what's wrong with that? Seligman. Oh, don't tell me you're getting jealous. Well, we're not that hard enough to work. In fact, there's no need for you to work at all for a while. Why don't you have a rest? And start raising the family. I told you. I'll think about it. Yes, that's as far as you get. Michael! You took that corner much too far. I know what I'm doing. And so do I. You're just being pig-headed. Now slow down for this one. Slow down, Michael. Haven't you any... Michael, look out! It wasn't my fault, but it served me right because I was going too fast. The big lorry was slewed three parts of the way across the lane. Quite evidently, I wasn't the only one who'd taken the corner too fast. We hit the rear of it with a glancing blow, shot up the bank and down again, and pulled up in the middle of the lane some 30 yards further off. You all right, darling? Yes, I'm all right. It wasn't your fault, Michael. Get out, both of you. What's biting you? The accident wasn't our fault. Are you getting out? Or do I pull you out? Now, look here. I... Shut up. Move. Lenny. All right. All the other... Take your hands off me. All right. Oh, you know what? you better got to come and tell you. Hey, Lenny, cut it out. What's the idea? Cut it out. I said I'll deal with it. Don't you want me to get... I said I'll deal with it. Now, get back to the lorry. Uh... The big oaf reluctantly released me and slouched off, leaving me wondering whether I'd have a broken neck in another couple of seconds. As I tried to massage some feeling back into my shoulder, I watched the second man wear at me. He was a tough, hard-faced-looking individual. But at least he didn't try to turn me into two pieces. You've had a lucky escape. Yes, so it seems one way or another. 
You took that corner too fast. Yes, and it looks as if you did just the same a few minutes earlier. That's right. Oh, I think we'd both better forget about it, don't you? Well, that's a thought. Is your lolly damaged? Well, nothing but a lick of paint won't put right. Well, we've only dented the mud guard. So in that case, we'll get going again. Yes, you do that. Your friend's a bit primitive, isn't he? You're being funny or just plain nosy? Oh, you're a bit touchy as well. Janet, I think so. I wouldn't be too curious if I were you, lady. Well, I'm... Pipe down, Jam. We don't want any more trouble. <laughs> They were not couple. Very. I could think of other descriptions as well. I noticed you weren't anxious to linger. Are you kidding? Didn't you notice what the large gentleman had in his hand? No, I couldn't see. It was a cosh. Well, I'm not altogether surprised. The other one kept his hand in his right pocket all the time he was talking to me. Yes, he probably had a gun there. That's what I thought. And yet you started baiting him. I wanted to see whether he'd pull it. Oh, look. No. And we're not on the stage now. When people pull guns in real life, they're loaded and not with blanks. Sorry, Michael. I've got used to that kind of scene in murder without motive. Mm, it is, eh? But just try to remember that in this case, they haven't got to stick to the dialogue of Act Three. When those sort of chaps start ad-libbing, the going's have to get rough. Yes, you're right. And that being the case, suppose you turn off to the left, just along there. Hmm? Then the car track? Why? Because it is a car track. And it's too narrow for the lorry to come down. The lorry? Have they started it? Soon after us. They're just around the next bend. And coming pretty fast. Well, in that case, I think we'll have a lights out. Oh, so this track's a bit bumpy. Eh? Better than a bump from the lorry. Mm, I think this is far enough. Right. See anything? Just a minute. They've just gone past the end of the track. They're going straight on without stopping. Yes, it's all right. We sat in the car and smoked to let them get well out of the way. Janet crooked her little finger and linked it in mine. A sign that peace had been restored and the bad temper on both sides was forgotten. Mickey? Hmm? What do you think they're up to? No, mm-hmm. maybe nothing. Oh, perhaps we're letting our imaginations run riot. The play's been running too long. I'm thinking too much like Detective Inspector Morton. Possibly. Yet, I, I don't know. After all, if we didn't actually see the gun, you didn't imagine the cosh. Well, that's true. Ordinary lorry divers don't go around coshing people just because they nearly had an accident. No, there's, there's something phony about them and dangerous. Oh, well, anyway, they're out of the way now. Shall we go? All right. Well, what's wrong? Why would it stop? Oh, I'm afraid it's not our lucky evening. Oh, no. Don't tell me you forgot to fill the tank. Yes, I'm afraid so. I'm sorry, darling. The tank's burned dry. And what about the reserve tank? Well, I switched over to reserve coming through Uxbridge. I thought I'd make that all-night garage at Amersham. Oh, there's another one nearer than that. Yes, well, I'll have to walk down to it and borrow a tin. I'll come with you. Well, there's no need. You stay here and rest. No, thank you. I know the lorry did go by, but all the same, I don't fancy sitting here on my own. I'm not in the mood for admiring the beauties of nature. Mm, perhaps you're right. Come on, then. Uh, the garage you're thinking of is just past the crossroads, isn't it? Yes, but I've just realized they'll be closed. We'll have to knock them up. <laughs> come on, darling, best foot forward. Yes, we've got 20 minutes walk ahead of us. Ah, it took us 25. Janet was quite right. The garage was closed. They're probably in bed. Well, we must get some bed for somehow. I- I'll wave a couple of quid at them. If you get the chance. Oh, I don't think like that. Anyway, I'm going to knock until they do wake up. We're closed. You see... I'm sorry to disturb you, but we're in a bit of difficulty. We're not serving anybody now. Well, if you could just let us have... I think we could. Yes, I know, but... Please, I'll take the dogs on you. Well, how do you like that for service? Oh, come on, Mickey. Well, of all the nerve. All right, darling, take it in. But we must have some petrol. You won't get any by shouting at me. 
After all, he doesn't have to open up. Come on, let's sneak around the back. Yes, that's an idea. I might find a tin somewhere we can leave the money for it. Yes. Come on, let's go along the fence here. Look. There's a light in that garage. You can see it under the closed door. Well, they're not in bed at all. No. Somebody's up, that's certain. So we'll get our petrol. Careful, darling. There's something odd about this. Since they're just a surly bunch of yokels, that's all. Oh, I'll give them a knock on these doors. Oh, Nicky, please. Let's go quickly. Never mind the petrol. It doesn't matter. Oh, I feel something awful's going to happen. Well, it's about time. Oh, it's you again. Don't move, mister, or I'll let you have it. Hey, Mac. Guess who we got for visitors? Well, well. It isn't our nosy friends from up the road. So you wouldn't take a hint, eh? Well, I'll give it to them now. Not yet. But I've got to hand it to you, Lenny. You were right, for once. Yeah. You should have knocked them off back up the road. Sure. That's what I said. Well, it doesn't make any difference. We can soon remedy our little error. Step inside, friends, and learn what happens to snoopers. If you'd like to display your dark weirdness wherever you go, you can find Weird Darkness t-shirts, buttons, hoodies, office supplies, clothes for your kids, stickers, magnets, coffee mugs, and a whole lot more in the Weird Darkness store, with dozens of designs to choose from and a variety of colors to match your style. You can grab some weirdo merchandise for yourself or maybe as a gift for the weirdo in your life by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. When last we left, Flater's explanation for why he needed bones in the classroom struck Manny as a bit hollow. But there was a bigger question. Where exactly did those bones come from? Flater told reporters that they had been obtained several years before, when acquiring human remains was easier and had been lying around the college many packed away in boxes and of little use to anyone. No doubt the medical school had bones stored away, but whether they had quite so many was another matter. And one theory that made the rounds during the meeting of a local medical association involved the distasteful idea that the trio had stolen or otherwise obtained them from the Potter's Field or Pauper's Cemetery on Hart Island. For a long time, Hart Island has been New York's naughty secret. A mile-long island at the eastern end of the Bronx, Hart has served many functions throughout its history, including acting as a Civil War prison camp, a tuberculosis sanatorium, and a Shutter Island-style psychiatric hospital. But most notably, it has acted since the late 19th century as a dumping place for New York's impoverished dead and holds the distinction of being the world's largest pauper's cemetery, with over a million interments. The first burial was in 1869, and the volume eventually grew so high that the dead were placed in large mass graves, three layers deep, with a level of sod between each layer. Pits for children, for instance, were so vast that they held up to 1,000 burials. By the time the room at Flower Hospital was being decorated, there had already been 110,751 burials on heart, so there were potentially plenty of bones to be obtained there. Bodies were delivered to the island by a boat named the Fidelity, captained by Edward McAvoy, who had received several demerits for misconduct while in the Navy. He would sail the East River to pick up bodies from the city morgue and Harlem Hospital, among others, and twice weekly during the winter and three times a week during the summer, drop them off on heart. 
the Fidelity could hold up to 100 corpses, which were covered over on the deck by tarps so that passing boats would not be able to see the grisly cargo. On the island, they were received by Superintendent of Burials John Bopp, who then processed them with a team of 50 convicts from Rikers Penitentiary. It was a nauseating spectacle, and as a crew member from the Fidelity told a reporter in 1900, it's all the same after you're dead, but if you want to know the advantage of passing away among friends, take a trip to Hart's Island on burying day. It would have been scandalous to the hospital if it were to turn out that the trio had been obtaining bones from the graves on Hart Island for their project, but the suspicious past of Meyer and Nielsen meant that the question would not go away easily. The pair had already come under media scrutiny in 1894 when the New York Times carried a story about how they were using narcotics to place stray dogs in Tacomas in order to experiment with a potassium solution as an antidote to morphine poisoning. Meyer at the time was known by his true first name of Oscar, although when he went into professional practice he adopted instead his middle name of Northway, apparently in order to avoid confusion with the Oscar Meyer Wiener Company, which had been founded in 1883. At the time, neither of the two were even properly physicians, having yet to graduate medical school, and they instructed the paper to omit the title of doctor, since, as they described it, they were simply students with an inquisitive bent. They would administer morphine intravenously to the dogs until they fell into a coma, very quick for a small mongrel, up to four hours for a large dog, and follow that with a solution of permanganate of potash. The validity of their experiment was questionable, but at least none of the dogs died, or so they claimed. Not surprisingly, the weight of both public and private opinion was falling heavily against Meyer, Nielsen, and Flater. The latter was vehement in his insistence that not only was the display ethical, it wasn't even intended to be morbid. If the bones present a sight most gruesome, he argued, it is because of the nature of the subject and not because I had any idea of arranging such an effect. Despite the claims of the trio that the room was simply a means to put the remains of the dead to good and practical use, the hospital's governing board eventually mandated that not only would they cease adding to the display, they would remove what had already been constructed. Such a spectacle might be fine for the Catholic bone houses of 7th century Europe, but modern New York would not tolerate it. And with that, amid suspicions of grave robbing and professional misconduct, America lost its one and only attempt at a fantastic charnel house. Coming up, Kell's Irish Pub in Seattle has a creepy vibe to it, even if the displays and decorations inside aren't meant to be. Perhaps that's because the building started its life as a massive mortuary. And early one February morning in 1897, John Mars jumped out of bed from a sound sleep, and while the smell of breakfast cooking downstairs wafted up to the second level of the house, he inexplicably grabbed his pistol and went on a shooting spree of his own family. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a weird darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, 
My friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Let's get back to the 11th hour and accident on a curve. Mac's invitation wasn't the kind I welcomed, but there wasn't any choice about it. As soon as we stepped inside the garage, Lenny pushed the big door shut. The big lorry was there, quite obviously undergoing considerable alterations. I'd read in the newspapers of the lorries and their cargoes which had been disappearing from the Great North Road. Now I knew just how they disappeared. I wondered what had happened to the real lorry driver and his mate. Looking at Lenny with a tire lever in his hand, I didn't have to wonder very hard. I tried to think of something else. It wasn't a very pleasant line of thought. There was a third man in the garage. He, of course, would be the garage owner. The man who didn't want to sell us any petrol. Understandable under the circumstances. Well, you satisfied your curiosity? We'll get on with the business. No, well, I haven't. Who are these people, Mac? They bumped into us on the road further up. They had their chance. They had to come following us. But we didn't. We only came... Shut up! Can't stand a woman squawking. I was only trying to tell you. Don't that... try and tell us anything. Now you heard what the boss said. Leave her alone. Look, Sonny. Don't try and play the little hero. Or you get hurt. And so will she. Yeah. But my wife. I'll do the talking, mister. All right, tie him up, Lenny. Tie him up? Look, it'd be easier to bash. Him. I said tie him up. I don't want to mark. Uh, I tie their hands behind their backs with that cord. All right, all right, just as you say. It almost seemed like the third act of the play. I put my hands behind me as I'd done every night for 12 months. But as the cords bit into my wrists, I knew that this was grim reality. With no escape guaranteed by a thoughtful author, it made it doubly frightening. Oh, that'll do fine, Lenny. Sure. Right. Now sit down on those old gentlemen, both of you. I'll stand. <laughs> well, why didn't you sit down before, eh? Lenny, Lenny. You're always so impetuous. What? Uh, impetuous? Uh, you'll have to excuse my friend. He finds words of more than one syllable a bit difficult. Oh. But he's a man of action. That's right. Perhaps you've gathered that by now. Now, don't knock him about, Lenny, unless you have to. Oh, well, you know, I never do. I never do. But some people just never learn. Well, I think he's got the idea now. Oh, well, Mickey, are you all right? Yes, sir. He's all right, just a bit shaken. He's learning the hard way. Oh, my wrists. The cords are hurting. You're too bad. Never mind, it won't be for long. Now, mister, where's your car? It's up the road. We came down here. I don't want we... the story of your life. You just answer my questions, that's all. You get it? Yes, I get it. Oh, learning. Now, get into this car. In the back, both of you. You can take us to where you left your car. Hey, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. Mac, what are you going to do? No need for you to worry, Bert. Lenny and I will look after these two. Yeah. That's right. Now, that's what I want to know. You just get cracking and fix that lorry. Well, look, I'm asking you what you... Asking, asking. You heard what Max said, didn't you? Oh, don't you try to rough me, Lenny, or, or you'll be sorry, both of you. I'll be sorry. We'll be sorry. I could break you in two. Lie down, down, Lenny. Lie down. Bert knows we've got to have his cooperation. Ah, uh, you bet I do. Just keep remembering that. Yeah. All right, all right. No sense in quarreling. You ought to know we can't let these two go. They send your garage. Yeah, what do they have? I'm not having anything to do with murder. Nobody asked you to. Oh, no. Well, I know enough about the law to know that if you and Lenny knock them off, I'm for it as well. And believe me, I'm not laying myself open to take any eight o'clock walk with the England. Oh, 
Oh, you don't want to worry, you know. You'd never be up in time. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, very funny, very funny. But you're not going to do it, see? Look, we promised not to say anything. Stay in the back of that car and keep quiet. But don't you see? Look, we could... Look, I've all got to attend to you as well. It's no good, Janet. Not good, shut up. <laughs> it learns quick. Now get in the front, Lenny. I'll drive. Okay. Hey, right, listen to me, Mac. You drive that car out of here and I'll pick up the phone. You pick up the phone. That's what I'll do. I'll pick it anywhere you are, Lenny. I'll handle it. Look, Bert, you've got it all wrong. Oh, right, yes. Nobody said anything about murder. Well, you said you were going I to said it. we can't let them go. So there'll have to be an accident. Hmm. What kind of an accident? <laughs> I think their car's going to catch fire in some place. <laughs> Good, eh? Catch fire? Oh, well, uh, if you're sure you can uh, fix it to look like an accident. Of course we can. Well, uh, it's different. You open the garage door, Bert, and stop worrying. You get ulcers if you're not careful. <laughs> okay, now you get that lorry fixed up. Jump along. just make out Janet staring wide-eyed in the dark. And I wondered whether she was feeling like me that it was all some horrible nightmare. It was difficult to believe that these two men were going to burn us to death in a matter of minutes. But I knew it was true. There were no blood-curdling threats, just a calm, methodic preparation, which somehow made it all seem more horrible. Did you bring that length of sash cord with you, Lenny? Yeah, I've got it right here. Right, we'll need it for the few. I suppose you fellows realize what you're heading into. The police will get you. There's no such thing as a perfect murder, you know. I quite agree. <laughs> but this is going to be an accident. A car catches fire. Happens all the time, you know. You're calmly sitting there talking about burning us to death. You can't do a thing like that. Why not? You couldn't be so inhuman. Look, lady, in my business, we can't take chances. We know too much. You've seen us and the truck. You shouldn't have come snooping. But we never meant to. I'm not concerned with what you meant or didn't mean. The way things are. Well, like I said, we can't take chances. But, Bernie... You won't feel a thing. Then he will knock you both out. That's right. Providing you behave. Oh. And it'll be a very great pleasure. Oh, but not too hard, Lenny, not too hard. You know, that's the trouble with him. He doesn't know his own strength. <laughs> How can he be so cold-blooded? Haven't you got any humanity at all? Can't afford it in my line of business. What's your business? I'm an actor. Then you ought to be used to this kind of stuff. Just regard it as a special performance. Without any encores. Is this the car track you came along? Well, I, I'm not sure. Look, up to now, I've been very considerate. Don't make things difficult for yourself at the end. Yes, yes, this is the thing. That's better. Oh, is it far along? Oh, no, 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 I can see it. Ah, here we are. How'd you get Lenny? All right. Now, how about you two? I said hop out. Let me make it worse if then he has to drag you out. <coughs> well, that's right. A bit of cooperation and you won't feel a thing. Right. Once over lightly. Oh. Hold on a minute. I want to ask you something. What is it? Make it snappy? Just as a matter of curiosity. What? That word again? Well, might as well be consistent. Well, what do you want to know? Uh, just what do you intend to do when Lenny's knocked us out? Quite simple. You see this bit of cord? We soak it in petrol. One end goes in the petrol tank, and the two of you go in the car. We stand back and light the other end. Up she goes. <laughs> A final curtain, you might say. Yes, I was counting on it being something like that. You were counting on it? Well, sort of. You see, you can't do it. There's no petrol in the tank. What? Have a look, Lenny. He's probably bluffing the time. Okay. That's why we came knocking up the garage. I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. Oh, give me a shot, what you think? Hey, there's nothing in the tank, Mac. 
Sure, sure, it is, sir. I get it. And we'll siphon some from our car. There's plenty there. Will anyone have dropped to get back to the garage? Yeah, I know that, but what are we going to siphon it with? Oh, look, a bit of rubber tubing. Oh, we ain't got any. All right, so we haven't got any rubber tubing. No, I'll tell you what. We could use our car and take theirs. It's a better car. Look, have some sense. No much the police would know it wasn't their car. No, there's nothing else for it. I'll have to go to the garage and fetch some petrol. Hey, well, what am I going to do with this time? Nothing. Just watch me. That's all. I'll be back in five minutes. Okay. <laughs> So we had five minutes' grace. But I couldn't see what good it was going to do us. Our hands were tied behind our backs, and I had no, no illusions there about what would happen if either of us tried to run or fight with our hands tied. <laughs> I tried to think what Detective Inspector Morton and in the play would have done. And then I thought of the last act of Murder Without Mercy. It was a slim chance, and it all depended on whether Janet picked up her cue. And don't move. Or you'll get it now. My wrists are hurting. Oh, now, so what? You won't be feeling anything in a few minutes. <laughs> That's a line from the play I'm appearing in. You see, we're both tied up and... Oh, I hope you've got good understudies. Not tied up tightly like this, of course. And so uh, you get loose, I suppose, eh? And then the villain gets his, and I'm the villain. That's all right. You know, but you won't, not this time. Yes, I know. That's the difference. You see, in the play, I say to him, you've been very clever, Barrett, but there's one thing you haven't allowed for. I knew Mary hadn't committed the murder. You mean you never really suspected me, Bill? Yeah, just a minute. What are you talking about? What's the caper? That's what she says in the play. I uh, only pretended to suspect you to put friend Barrett off his guard. Oh, is that so? Well, he'll have to bring the curtain down now. I can hear Mac coming in the car. You remember how it finishes, Janice? Of course. Then no! Oh. 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 It worked. She's out cold. Come on, quickly. Across the field into that wood. They'll never find us in the dark. <laughs> been a long shot, but we'd have the luck with us. I hope that Janet would catch on, for unless you do it together, it's useless. It's a tricky thing to do, and Janet and I had had a lot of trouble over it at rehearsals. But when you've been doing it for 12 months, night after night, your timing gets pretty good. I butted Lenny in the chest with my head while Jan threw herself against the back of his legs. And that was curtains for Lenny. Well, the police caught them a few days later... But we aren't playing in murder without motive any longer. We find that third act a bit too grim for our liking now. for another mounting drama of action and suspense when we again bring you The Eleventh Hour. Up next, it's Exploring Tomorrow with Country Boy from December 18th, 1957. Before we get into that story, though, Kill's Irish Pub in Seattle has a creepy vibe to it, even if the displays and decorations inside aren't meant to be. Maybe that's because the building itself started as a massive mortuary. That story is up next when Weird Darkness Retro Radio returns. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on, 
You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. If there is a definitive go-to Irish pub in Seattle, Washington, it's Kells in the Pike Place Market. Just about any local you ask, who doesn't live the teetotal life, has spent an after-work happy hour on its post-alley patio or a drunken St. Patrick's Day or two in this creaky, spooky, old-fashioned bottom-floor bar, perhaps partaking in the city's largest collection of single malt scotch. But not everyone who hangs out at Kells knows that there is a great reason why it is so creepy in there. Kells is in the ground floor of the Butterworth Building, as in E.R. Butterworth, who built Seattle's first mortuary inside this building and who basically invented the modern funeral as we know it. And the very words, mortuary and mortician for that matter. Kells occupies the former stables and funeral wagon garage. Half a block east from Kells, the Greco-Roman sandstone arches at 1921 First Avenue were, as Seattle Mets editor-in-chief James Ross Gardner wrote in 2012, a passageway of sorts from this life into the next. Beginning in 1903, when Butterworth & Sons moved in to this snappy new building after bouncing around from the old Masonic Temple at 2nd and Pike to another location on 2nd and then another on 3rd, E.R. & Company had a monopoly on the death industry in Seattle. For the first few decades that followed, just about everyone who died in Seattle sailed through this building's archway. Many of the dead came through without names or identification. The era in which Seattle was settled saw epidemics of tuberculosis, diphtheria, and Spanish flu, likely among others, and without proper burial services available. The case before Butterworth & Sons, dead bodies would regularly just appear on the streets of downtown Seattle. It got so bad that the city started offering undertakers $50 per body that they could take off the streets as a community cleanup effort. Butterworth saw an opportunity and took it, and it would make him a very wealthy man. He hired John Graham, the English architect whose firm would later design the Space Needle, to plan out his grand five-story mortuary with a 200 mortar chapel, a crematorium, a columbarium for storing funeral urns, a casket showroom, and an elevator, the very first on the West Coast, used for transporting bodies up and down this marvelous palace of death. Butterworth had Graham draw up eight different blueprints before he presented one that was to Butterworth's liking. The building was done up in the Beaux-Arts style of the era, with four sculpted lion heads on the facade, facing First Avenue from three stories up. The aforementioned space that Kells now sits in held horses and hearses, concealed in the alley to hide the unsightly bodies from public view. The floors above were tricked out in mahogany, bronze and brass fixtures, elaborate stained glass, and general Victorian filigree. The spacious chapel had pews of Flemish oak, a choir loft, and a newfangled system of light signals that a choir, should the family hire one, could follow to start or stop singing. Some of the services offered for Butterworth & Sons funeral packages were the transport of the body to the mortuary washing the body, dressing the body, embalming, newspaper death notices, limousine and hearse service, casket with optional crushed silk interior, fresh flowers, burial permit, air-sealed vault, and musicians. There was nothing like it in the United States, Gardner said of Butterworth & Sons, maybe nothing like it in the world. 
Edgar Ray Butterworth never meant to work as an undertaker to begin with. Born in the Boston suburbs in 1847, he found himself working as a cattleman on the plains of Kansas when he encountered a grieving settler while traveling with his team. The man, whose wife and newborn child had both just died, had no lumber available for coffins on the prairie. Butterworth, it said, built a coffin for the guy with wood taken from his own wagon. Everyone in turn of the century Seattle knew E.R., who also served in the state legislature, and his oldest son, Gilbert, respectively by E.R.'s signature long goatee and his son's high classic cheekbones and all-around good looks. They trusted the Butterworths with their family members who'd passed on, although it is unclear whether folks did because they wanted to or because they didn't really have a choice. As for its modern-day incarnation as Kells, it has ghosts. Everyone who even vaguely follows that sort of thing will tell you this. The most cited one is a young girl of about eight years old with blonde or red hair. She supposedly shows up most when the traditional Irish music is going, appearing in the main room or on the stairs. Its less famous ghost is Sammy, who will show up in the mirror on the back wall. People say you'll see a man's face in the mirror looking right at you, but if you turn around to check him out, he vanishes. Turn back around to face the mirror, he's right there again, grinning at you. There are also ghosts that never show their faces, according to local legend. There is a small, ornate whiskey bar in the back corner of the restaurant, just a little corner bar that's easy to miss, but if you keep an eye on it, the candles all around the bar will allegedly light up on their own. Glasses are known to break on their own, silverware will levitate, and disembodied women's voices are heard. That same stairwell in the back, where the little red-haired girl hangs out, is supposedly home to lots of other spirits, too, who turn up in photographs via orbs. Or maybe it's just dust. Mercedes Caraba, who once ran the now defunct, uh, <coughs> full disclosure, market ghost tours, told KUOW in 2009 that she spotted a pair of muddy, dirty hands pressed up in the windows of the First Avenue entrance to the building. The area is just kinda inarguably deathy, said Caraba, with a Duwamish burial site nearby and a 19th century settler's graveyard a block away. That said, this building hasn't been a mortuary or a funeral parlor for a really long time. In 1923, E.R. Butterworth moved his business to the western slope of Capitol Hill at the northeast corner of Melrose Avenue and Pine Street. The new building was even more souped up and deluxe, with a crematorium and columbarium, fireproof vaults, an even bigger chapel and drawing rooms, purses equipped with Cadillac motor equipment with special designed bodies Pioneer historian Clarence Bagley wrote of it in 1929, in addition to funeral furnishings from the most simple to the magnificent. E.R. passed the business on to his sons, who passed it on to theirs, and it remained in the family until New Orleans-based chain Stewart Enterprises bought Butterworth Funeral Home in 1998, making it one of the longest operating family-owned businesses in Seattle history. The last Butterworth to run it was E.R.'s great-grandson, Bert Butterworth Jr., who was the one who sold it. Kells moved into the former livery in 1983, and not much of the grandiose Victorian interior of Butterworth & Sons remains there, or even inside the building's upper floors for that matter. Other than the bar, the building has been more or less empty, as long as anyone can remember, except for the ghosts, if you count those. Its deathy superstitions are still being kept alive by the building's current owners, though. Since 2005, the Butterworth block has been owned by the McAleese family, which also owns Kells, and the same year it was purchased, Karen McAleese saw something in the pub's kitchen that she still can't explain. He was a tall man who looked like he was part black with a suit jacket on, she reported to the Seattle Times. He had very thin hands 
He walked to the end of the bar and just kind of faded. Whether it's Halloween or St. Patrick's Day, if you're in Seattle and you feel like having an otherworldly experience, you just might want to spend it at an Irish pub and try your luck. Coming up, early one February morning in 1897, John Mars jumped out of bed from a sound sleep and while the smell of breakfast cooking downstairs wafted up to the second level of the house, he inexplicably grabbed his pistol and went on a shooting spree of his own family. That story is coming up, but right now it's Exploring Tomorrow with Country Boy from December 18th, 1957. Step into the incredible, amazing future as we go exploring tomorrow. And now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, the editor of Astounding Science Fiction Magazine, John Campbell, Jr., the two o'clock jet from Montana has just landed at New York, bringing in some 200 passengers, including some who have come to the world's largest city for the first time. Roy Bartlett is one of these, big strapping kid out to seek fame and or fortune, and New York was ready for him. The ancient custom of fleecing the country yoko will not die out for quite a few centuries to come. He just emerged from the port terminal and was looking around, big-eyed and confused and bewildered by the immensity of it all, when a girl came up to him. Hello there. Waiting for someone? Uh, uh, did you speak to me, miss? That's who I was talking to, Hanson. I asked you, are you waiting for someone? Oh, no, no, no. That is... I mean, I just got here, miss. I came in from Montana on the, on the jet plane there. Oh, you got friends here? Oh, I'm afraid I don't, miss. I just sort of decided to up and come to the city and sort of try my luck at it. Well, maybe I can help you. I sort of like you. You do? Mm-hmm. You know, something in me wants to help strangers to, to show them the ropes. And I've got free time now. I'd, I'd like to, well, spend it with you. Oh, you're so kind, isn't it? So pretty. <laughs> you think so? Oh yes, yes. You're you're the prettiest girl I've ever seen. Your smile, your eyes, you Oh, you're good. I can tell you you're warm and sweet. It's good of you to come to talk to me like this, to stand so close to me. Well, I think I like you too. Uh, what did you say your name was? I didn't. Oh, I, I mean, it's Bartlett, that Roy Bartlett. Well, I'm Diana Lawson. Mm. You're big. <laughs> Strong, I'll bet. Handsome. Well, does it, does it always happen this way? Uh, Suppose we stop in for a bite to eat at that refresher man and get to know each other, huh? I think that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> Each drink you want, you put a half-credit coin in the slot and punch out the combination. Mm -hmm. For a martini, you punch out four, three, six, like it says on the board up there. Here, give me the money. I'll get us some drinks. Huh? All right. Four, three, six. Mm. There we are. Whoa. So nice dry martini. Here, you take yours and we'll go to that table. Oh, careful, Lisa. Don't spill it. Well, aren't, aren't we going to get anything to eat? Oh, we can eat later. The occasion calls for a drink to, to celebrate your arrival. Here you are. And sip it this time. Well, I'm, I'm sorry if I did the wrong thing with the drink. I just didn't know, of you know. Of course you didn't know but you learn all these things, Roy. 
Uh, where are you from? Why are you here? Well, I worked all my life on my father's farm, and he died last year and left me all alone out there. So uh. I kept things going a while and then figured I ought to try something different. And sold the farm, and I bought a ticket to New York in one week. Ah. Uh. It must seem like a different world to you. Oh, it does. Big and frightening, unfriendly. At least it seemed unfriendly at first. Till I met you, darling. <laughs> uh, I can't ever thank you enough for coming over to me when I was alone. You don't need to thank me, Roy. Just common decency to help a stranger out. <laughs> Especially when he's a good-looking stranger. Uh... When are you seeing the central computer? The what? The central computer. Huh? Well, it runs New York, you know. Keeps the trains moving, the traffic lights, everything. You have to register with a computer when you establish permanent residence here. If you don't have a job, the computer will give you one. You didn't even know that. I guess I hadn't heard. Well, where do I find this uh, computer? Just ask any policeman. He'll get you there. Oh, Diana, you're swell for helping me out like this. I mean, I was... Oh, there's some way I could thank you for this. Oh, I told you it's just common decency. Uh, Roy, the money from the sale of your farm, did you bring it with you? You bet. Yes, sir. 5000 in cash and the same in traveler's checks. Oh, so much. You carrying it around with you? Yeah, sure. Hey, that's dangerous, Roy. You'd better put it in the bank right away. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know any banks. Oh, I'll take you to one. Come on. Uh, unless you want another drink before we go. No, no, I haven't, I haven't finished this one yet. Here, wait a minute. Mmm. <laughs> those, those things taste better after you've had a few, you know? <laughs> now, come along. I'll take you to the bank and then to the computer. Oh, it's wonderful of you to take this interest in me. They they warned me New Yorkers were unfriendly people, but they sure aren't. <laughs> Down this way. In here. But it's dark and this. Hey! Go ahead, my head up! Get away from me, you... We'll continue with Exploring Tomorrow in just a moment when Weird Darkness Retro Radio comes back. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Mrs. Emma Mars and her sister-in-law, Ida Mars, were preparing breakfast the morning of February 13, 1897, in their home at 129 South Upper Street, Lexington, Kentucky. Around 7.45, Mrs. Mars sent the servant girl upstairs with a bowl of warm water so her husband John could wash up. When she entered the room, John jumped out of bed with such a peculiar expression on his face that she quickly set the water down and hurried out of the room. She was halfway down the stairs when she heard a pistol shot from the bedroom. Mr. and Mrs. Mars and their two children, John Jr., age 5, and Helen, age 15, 
slept in two beds in the same room. John Marr Sr. had shot his son in the forehead as he lay in bed. The shot startled Helen awake. She saw what had happened and started screaming. John fired two shots at Helen. One missed her, the other went through her neck. Helen ran from the room as Emma and Ida approached the room. Running into her mother's arms, Helen cried, "'Oh, Mama! Papa has killed me! Don't go in there! He'll kill you!' Ida Mars entered the room just as John Mars smashed the head of his wounded son with the pistol. He turned the gun on his sister and fired. When the shot missed Ida, he threw the pistol at her head, knocking her to the ground. The boy was still crying in pain. Mars drew a straight razor and, with a wild, maniacal laugh, cut his son's throat from ear to ear. He then did the same to his own throat, severing his windpipe and jugular vein. Hearing the gunshots, neighbors forced open the door and rushed in. In the bedroom, now quiet, they found a gruesome scene. The young boy lay on the bed, shot, beaten, and slashed. John Mars lay on the floor in a sea of blood. In the hall, Helen was wounded and unconscious, Ida was in a state of shock, and Emma was suffering from nervous prostration. John Mars had a history of mental illness. At age 22, he was courting Emma Davis and asked for her hand in marriage. When she refused, he became infuriated and swore he would kill her if she did not marry him. Mars was judged insane and committed to the Eastern Kentucky Asylum. After six months, the doctors determined him cured and he was released. Emma then agreed to marry him and they settled into a happy marriage. John had a successful career with M. Kaufman and Company Clothiers and owned a great deal of real estate and interest in several building associations. He belonged to the Knights of Honor and the Odd Fellows and was a deacon at the Central Christian Church. Around Christmas, 1896, John was taken violently ill, having peculiar headaches. Since then, he had not been in his right mind. He was given to spells of melancholy during which he would discuss suicide. Dr. Joseph Bryan examined John and advised the family to commit him to the asylum again. The night before the murder, he said to his wife and sister, I'm not afraid to die, but I can't bear to leave you all. I want my children to go with me. Thinking he was joking, one of them responded, Why, what are you going to do with your wife and sister? Oh, you must come too, he said. I want all of you. The Mars family was one of the oldest and most prominent families in Kentucky. The funeral for John Mars Sr. and John Mars Jr. on February 14th filled the Central Christian Church with 1,500 mourners, and many more stood outside blocking the streets for blocks. Father and son were buried in the same grave. Coming up on Weird Darkness Retro Radio, the brutal death of an African slave brings a curse upon the wooden chest he was ordered to construct. First, though, let's get back to Exploring Tomorrow and Country Boy. You are Roy Bartlett, age 25, height 6 feet 2 inches, weight 185 pounds, born in Helena, Montana, 17 February 2184. Parents deceased. If any of this information is incorrect, please amend it. That's all correct, sir. Use of honorific titles is not necessary when addressing us. According to the report of the police officer who found you, you were beaten and robbed shortly after your arrival in New York. That's right. She said she wanted to help me to to show me the ropes in New York. Identify more specifically the she to whom you refer. She gave her name as Diana Lawson. Describe her. Oh, she's a uh, medium height, 5'4 uh, or so, and blonde hair. Good looking. 
cute face. Well, the eyes are a little hard now that I think about it. She she looks about uh, 23 or so. Our record banks hold no information on someone of that name fitting the description you give. The name was obviously assumed. Your introduction to New York life was unfortunate, but not uncommon. Do you plan to remain here as a permanent citizen? Yes, I, I, I mean, yes. What are your vocational plans? I'm afraid I don't have any. Your previous experience is wholly agricultural. This will be of little use to you in the metropolitan area. Have you any preference for the type of work you would like to do? This would guide us in assigning you. I'd... Well, I'd like to help people, if you know what I mean. I'd like to keep people from having the thing happen that, that happened to me. I mean, New York is full of confused, unhappy people who have to prey on others like the girl did on me. You regard her as confused, unhappy? Of course. I can't think of her as being just, well, wicked. People aren't born bad or good. They're, they're raised that way. Maybe she could have been helped a few years ago, and then she wouldn't have to go around robbing strangers. You harbor no hatred for the girl. I sort of never looked at it as hatred, sir. I, I mean... I'm sorry, sir, I can't help calling you, sir. If it makes you more comfortable, you may. Thanks, sir. Well, as as I was saying... No, I, I, I don't hate that girl, Diana. I'd help her if I could. She is a warped criminal. But is that permanent, sir? Can't she be brought in and straightened out somehow? There is psychological rehabilitation for criminals, yes. Well, you mean if she could only be caught and brought in, she could be turned into a useful citizen? If she could be found... In a city this large, it is not always possible to track criminals. Well, I'd like to try to find her, sir. I mean, that's my vocational plans. I'd like to become a policeman, sir. You will have to face psychological testing first, of course, and a training period of six months. But let us warn you, Roy Bartlett, if your motive in this is one of revenge, you will not survive the first battery of tests. Revenge? Oh, no, not revenge, sir. I want to help that girl. And the others like her. Honest, that's what I want to do. This will be demonstrated in the tests. Do you think I'll make the grade, sir? The tests will answer that. But I mean, you computers can figure probabilities. Can't you tell me if it... You are most unusual, Roy Bartlett. But the probability favors your success. You will be taken to the testing center immediately. And if you are approved, you will go to the training camp. Oh, thanks, sir. Thanks for, for listening to me. Will you wish me good luck? Our data banks do not show the validity of such a wish, Roy Bartlett. But if your statements today were sincere, you should have no difficulty attaining your goal. The robot will show you to the testing center. <laughs> a computer can talk about revenge, uh, that's a word that can be put in its vocabulary. But it couldn't understand what revenge meant. It couldn't understand human feelings of any kind. For that, human beings are necessary. For that, Roy had to be passed along to human beings who could teach him, could understand him, could help him understand himself, and find what his life work should be. Mind if I sit down here, miss? You seem to be alone. I am alone. Glad to have some company. Sit down, stranger. Thanks. Thanks very much. You waiting for someone? Yeah, I was. I don't think he's going to show up. You must know how that sort of thing is. When someone you're counting on doesn't show... Yeah. Yes, I know what that's like, Diana. And I've been looking for you almost a year. You know my name. Who are you? You mean you've forgotten me, Diana? 
I suppose you would have. The pitiful greenhorn you picked up last March? You. The Montana fella. That's right. Roy Barton. You taught me how to drink a martini, remember, in this very place. And then you taught me what it was like to be robbed by someone you trusted. I'm getting out of here. You can't keep me here. You'll leave when I want you to leave, Diana. Not before sit still. Don't make a fuss. Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. You just sit and try to look relaxed. Don't attract attention. You can't prove anything. Now leave me alone or I'll call a cop. Go ahead, Diana. Call one. Now look. My dad. Oh, no. You... That's right. I found a job in the big city, Diana. Six months of training and the breaking in period. I don't happen to be wearing my uniform now, but the badge is real. What are you going to do with me? Take you away, Diana, to Psych Center, where they can help you straighten up and grow the way God meant you to. You know, girl, you really did help me, and it really was worth the 5000 you took from me. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and you showed me how to get the kind of job I wanted. What are you talking about? you never done any farming, have you, Diana? Probably don't realize what a farmer's job is. Well, it's making things grow. Grow strong and right the way they were meant to. But I guess I got sort of tired of working just with plants. No, no, no. They'll kill me. They'll make me into something I hate and something that'll hate me. It won't be me. I'll be a, a zombie or something. Mm, I suppose it does seem that way. Mm. You never tried it the other way, though, have you? Without hate and bitterness driving you. You mean tried being dead? No, I haven't. No, I mean stop running and start doing what you want for yourself instead of what you think you want to do to somebody else. Now, look. We need Mike, too, your accomplice. He's outside, isn't he? Yeah. Okay. Let's walk out together. Act natural. That's right. Just walk along with me as if I'm a rube you picked up when you're taking me down the block to that dark alleyway. Yeah, yeah. Where's Mike? Is he right behind us? He ought to be. Mike! Mike, get him! He's a cop! That stun gun blast ought to keep him on ice for a couple of hours. Long enough to get him down to headquarters, anyway. I hate you. Why does this have to happen? Why couldn't you left me alone? I wanted to help you. Help me. By turning me in like this behind me over the head shrinker. They'll heal you, Diane. Take all the bitter hatred out of your mind. Make you a useful citizen. Who wants to be a useful citizen? I had a good thing here until you busted it up. Now they'll fix me, so I'll have to go straight be a, a good girl. Sell buttons on shirts for 30 credits a week. There are good jobs open for rehabilitated criminals. Nobody will hold your past against you. Good job. I'll never be able to go near my old friends. I'll have to begin life all over. It's somebody new. That's right. And I'll be there to help you start all over. You? Sure. I'll be there to help you. I told you I owe you that. Come along now. Let's go down to headquarters. to work with material things. And some can't see beyond it. When they can't see beyond material things, they're like Diane. Some people like to work with information. Bits of data. Accountants, lawyers, many people work with data and information. So do computers. But some go beyond that and they want to work with human beings. Now, some lawyers are not merely information handlers. They're human handlers. I guess Roy was one of those who wanted to go beyond the material and even the low living things. He wanted to work with humans. You see, Diane did do him a favor. 
And he did owe her a favor. She'd shown him what his real life work should be. We're coming out of Exploring Tomorrow, and we're heading further into the past. To July 25, 1949, Murder by Experts and the Big Money is coming up on Weird Darkness Retro Radio. In the near future, virtual reality games are indistinguishable from the real world. Players can take on the role of a star quarterback or rule as the king of a virtual kingdom. 13-year-old Jake prefers to spend his free time building Zaloria, a virtual world he created from scratch, where he and his two best friends, Des and Carrie, spend their afternoons completing quests and collecting treasure. However, all in Zaloria is not what Jake expected. When Jake discovers that the world he built is growing and changing on its own, he and his friends uncover a secret that could change the world forever. Jake and his friends must fight for survival when his virtual world takes on a mind of its own. Game Alive, a science fiction adventure novel by Trip Ellington, narrated by Darren Marlar. Here a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Coming up on Weird Darkness Retro Radio, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, there is a home built by slaves that is considered the most haunted in Alabama. First, though, let's jump into Murder by Experts with the Big Money from July 25, 1949. Murder by experts. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, world-famous mystery novelist and author of the recently published bestseller, The Life of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective writers, those experts who are themselves masters of the art of murder and can hold tensity at its highest. This time, our guest expert is the noted mystery writer, Miss Frances Crane. From the many thrillers she has read and enjoyed, Miss Crane has selected a gripping and dramatic story by Philip Andrews. And now we present... James Stevens in The Big Money. The Big Money. Yeah, I was in The Big Money. An hour and a half ago, I had seven million dollars. I had a wife, too. Slender, dark-haired, green eyes, and a cute figure. But she's gone now. She left me one hour and 30 minutes ago. No, one hour, 31 minutes, and 20 seconds ago. And she took the money with her. That's not all she took. She took my life. I wish she'd come back. I want my life back. I don't care about the money. She could keep that. After all, it only took me a month to earn it. That's right, one month. 30 days to earn $7 million. What's the trick? You have to be born for it. Born for the big money. And I was. I always knew it. As far back as I can remember, even back in prison, even back before that in military hospitals while the dogs patched up my face and tried to patch up my memory, I knew I was born for the big money. 
That's why I wasn't downhearted when they let me out of the big house with the usual five spot and a ticket to the city and no prospects. The warden tried to give me a pep talk, but I put him in his place fast, believe you me. George, I'm glad you're leaving us today. I won't keep you long, but I want to help you if I can. That's nice of you, warden. Mighty nice. The uh, prison psychiatrist says you only have a partial memory of your military service and no memory at all of the period before that. That's right. I remember coming to in a hospital and being told a shell burst had kn- knocked me out and cut up my face. That's as far as back as it goes. We've checked your army career. You're a troublemaker. In fact, you were under arrest on charges of stealing government property when that shell hit the guardhouse. So what, Warden? You were dishonorably discharged. But still, it might be possible to get medical treatment for your condition. Now, if you want me to contact the proper authorities... Skip it. Suppose I could remember everything that happened to me. I don't want to. Growing up in a slum, being kicked around, who wants to remember that kind of stuff? But your parents, your family, don't you want to find them again? They probably forgot me years ago. I'm looking ahead, not behind me. Take the average guy with a memory. He can't concentrate. He's distracted by all the things he remembers. Me? I can look straight ahead and stick to business. And that business is getting myself into the big money. Well, if that's how you feel, I won't say any more. Good luck anyway. Thanks, Warden. Thanks. Anyway. So that was that. Ten minutes later, I was a free man. After two long years. I hiked straight for the railroad station and caught the first express for New York. Then I ambled back to the club car and ordered a drink. I relaxed and sat back, feeling good. Very good. Across the aisle, a girl was reading a magazine. A knockout. Black hair, green eyes, and lips like rosebuds. Pretty soon she saw me watching her, but she was smooth. She didn't even seem to look at me while she gave me a long, steady once-over. She was interested, I knew that. She turned to a short, plump, white-haired man beside her and whispered something. White hair gave me a long look, too. Then he got up and came across, smooth as butter. I beg your pardon. I have the feeling we're acquainted, but I can't quite bring your name to mind. My name's George Cook, if that's any help. Cook? Cook. Now, I'm afraid I've mistaken you for someone else. Yes, of course. You remind me strongly of my old friend, Howard Vincent. Never heard of him. Well, the likeness is striking. But my apologies, I didn't mean to intrude upon you. Oh, you're not intruding. Uh... Davenport is my name. Philo Davenport. Mr. Davenport? Trains are pretty dull when you're traveling alone, don't you think? Insufferably dull. Perhaps you care to join me and my niece for a drink, uh, Mr. Cook. He didn't have to ask me twice. In fact, he didn't have to ask me once. Because if they hadn't picked me up, I was going to pick them up. In ten minutes, we were as cozy as three mice in a cheese factory. Marlene was her name. Marlene. Saying it was like tasting old brandy. Marlene and I got along fine. But I could feel them both sizing me up. Eyeing my going away from prison suit. And I knew they were sharpshooters with some cute game on their minds. By and by, Marlene came to the point I knew they were interested in. <laughs> You're very witty, Mr. Cook. What line of business are you in? Traveling salesman? Now, my dear, you mustn't ask personal questions. <laughs> I don't mind, Mr. Davenport. The truth is, I'm a free traveler. A free traveler? What's that? Well, you see, they set me free this afternoon, and now I'm traveling. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> very good, Mr. Cook. Very good. <laughs> Such frankness is refreshing. And what business are you in, Mr. Davenport? Well, I'm part lawyer and part detective. I have a specialty all my own. I trace heirs to unclaimed fortunes. Interesting business. Do you ever find them? Frequently. (laughs) In fact, much oftener than I have any right to expect. Oh, now, Uncle Philo, you mustn't vote. Of course not, my dear. 125th Street. Next stop, 125th Street. Well, this seems to be our stop, Mr. Cook. Where are you staying in town? I haven't quite made up my mind. I thought I'd look around a bit first. I see. Marlene and I would like to have you come call on us tomorrow, the next day. Wouldn't we, my dear? 
Oh, we'd love it if you would. Well, in that case, I will. Fine, George. Here's my card. Don't fail us now. Please promise you'll come, George. All right, Marlene. I'll drop in on you. Sure, I was going to drop in on him. Philo obviously was up to some little game, and if I could find out what, it might pay me. So I dropped in the very next morning, at 2 a.m. I didn't bother to wake Philo or Marlene. What kind of a friend would disturb them at that hour? I just let myself in with a pick lock, found the living room, and started going through it. I began with the drawers of a mahogany desk. And I was just getting going when the overhead light snapped on. And Philo's voice said... Good morning, George. So nice of you to come see us so soon. I turned, nice and carefully. There was Philo in a dinner jacket and Marlene wearing a gown that started at the floor and stopped unexpectedly. Oh, now, Uncle Philo, don't make George think he isn't welcome. Put away that gun. Offer him a drink. Of course, my dear. George, if I put away this gun, will you sit down for a glass of brandy and a nice quiet chat? Why not, Philo? I'll sit here on the couch. I was just looking around the room while I waited for you. <laughs> Admirable. Marlene, he's our man. <laughs> I know he is. Congratulations, George. I'll get the brandy, Uncle Philo. You know, George, I made a bet with Marlene. You'd show up tonight. Philo, I underestimated you. So you were waiting for me. Yes, we've been waiting for you. Since we left you on the train, I've checked your entire career. Your army record, your being wounded, your prison sentence for robbery after your discharge, your loss of memory, everything. That's fast work. Well, it's my business. On the train, Marlene and I were startled at your resemblance uh, to a certain Howard Vincent. Yeah, you mentioned him before. Who is he? I'll come to that in a moment. I said that my business is finding missing heirs who have fortunes waiting for them. I'm successful at it, George. Because sometimes when an heir can't be found, I create one. Philo, I'm beginning to think you aren't honest. <laughs> Which brings me now to Howard Vincent. He died in a train wreck in 1941. I saw his body, but only I know for certain that he is dead. I see. Go on. For four years, an estate of seven million dollars has been waiting for him to turn up to claim it. Seven million. And a few odd thousands. Here's the brandy, Uncle Philo. Oh, oh, thank you, my dear. Thank you. Here you are, George. Right. Now I propose a toast to Howard Vincent, formerly George Cook, and to seven million dollars, divided 50-50. <laughs> this was it. What I'd always known would happen someday. The break. The big money. Seven million dollars. Seven million just waiting for me to reach out and grab it. The three of us sat up most of the night while Philo outlined the deal. You see, George, you're perfect for the part of Howard Vincent. You look enough like him so that we can claim it's the scars from your wound that keep the resemblance from being exact. I think they rather improve your looks, George. I wouldn't want you to look too much like Vincent. In his photographs, he's rather vicious looking. Well, yeah, thanks, Marlene. I never dreamed that shellburst was going to blow me right into seven million dollars. Three and a half million. Remember? Oh, sure. Three and a half. Your loss of early memory is also very fortunate. Ordinarily, we would have to fake it to explain why you didn't remember little details of your past. And that's so hard to do. Uncle Philo tried it once, but the results were very bad, weren't they, Uncle Philo? Uh, <laughs> let's not dwell on that case, my dear. In this instance, George's army medical history authenticates his condition. So he doesn't need to remember a thing. I told the warden that memories only handicap a man. Your prison record will have to be freely admitted. Naturally, you'll be thoroughly checked. Sure. But suppose they manage to trace me back to before the army, to the time I can't remember about. What then? They won't. You see, I am in charge of the search for Vincent. You? How come, Philo? 
Uh, Howard Vincent was a typical rich man's son. Too much money, too much freedom. You know the story, George? Sure, I've read it a dozen times. It was back in 1941. He got mixed up in something really nasty and disappeared. Then the family got word he'd been killed in the wreck of the Western Flyer in Wyoming. You remember, 30 dead. Oh, but I forgot. You don't remember. I'll look it up in the papers. Go on. Uncle Philo flew out and found that a watch and a wallet belonging to Vincent had been recovered from the wreckage. There were also three bodies, any one of which might be Vincent. I get the picture. He was a little hard to identify by then. Yes, but I recognized one of the three as poor dear Howard Vincent all the same. However, I was already foreseeing, shall we say, uh, future possibilities. Philo, now I know you're not honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came back to report I hadn't been able to identify any of the dead as Howard. He might still be alive. So his father kept on hoping. When the old man died in 1945, he left his money to his son, provided Howard could be found within seven years. And he left me an annual retainer to keep looking for him. And now at last you found him. No, my dear. Not for several weeks yet. You see, we have careful preparations to make. Very, very careful preparations. Philo's plan was nice and simple. I went down to the Bowery and got a room in a cheap flop house. Next day, I found a job as a mechanic. Every day after that, I ate lunch in Battery Park near the Wall Street District. At the end of three weeks, Philo just happened to be walking through the park and saw me. Next day, he brought old Mr. Peebles, the lawyer for the Vincent estate, to give me the once-offer. Mr. Peebles oohed and odd, and I was discovered. As easy as that. Of course, it didn't end there. They asked me a million questions. They traced my record, prison, army, hospital, wound, everything. They had high-priced docs check me over to be sure my lack of memory was on the level. But at the end of the month, they hadn't proved I wasn't Howard Vincent. And then Philo and I gave little Mr. Peebles the clincher. The old one, too. Well, Mr. Peebles, are you satisfied that we've really found Howard at last? Yeah, me, Mr. Davenport, I just can't seem to make up my mind whether he is Howard or not. I think he is, but it'd uh, be dreadful if we made a mistake. How completely right you are, Mr. Peebles. But I think I have the evidence that will settle our doubts for good and all. Why, it's a college history book. Uh, one of the books Howard used at Yale. Yesterday I had an inspiration. I searched all of Howard's old books, and at last I found what I'd hoped for. See, here on page 98. Yes, the faded fingerprint in ink on the margin. Made one night ten years ago when Howard was studying. The only fingerprint of his we've ever located. So it is. My goodness, this is important. This, this, why, this will tell us beyond question whether this young man is Howard or not. Yes, we only have to compare his fingerprints with this print Howard made ten years ago, and we'll know. Well, George, are you willing to make the test? Certainly I am. If I'm not Howard Vincent, I want to know it. If I am, I want to enjoy it. A very reasonable attitude. Dear me, yes. Will you uh, make the print, Mr. Davenport? Murder by Experts continues in just a moment. First, though, I've got that story about a Tuscaloosa, Alabama home built by slaves, which is considered the most haunted in Alabama. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv.
150 years ago, Jacob Cooley ordered his African-American slave, Hosea, to build a chest for his first child. Hosea set to work, crafting a wooden chest of some remark. For some unknown reason, his master was displeased with his efforts and beat his slave to a pulp, killing him. Cooley's other slaves vowed to avenge the death of their friend and sprinkled the dried blood of an owl in the chest and had a conjure man curse the chest. As if by magic, Cooley's firstborn died in infancy, and over the forthcoming years, a total of 17 deaths were attributed to the conjure chest. An elegant mahogany veneer chest of drawers, hand-carved by an African-American slave 150 years ago, resides in the Kentucky Historic Museum at Frankfurt. Crafted in the Empire style, the chest has glass knobs on its four drawers. Nothing about its outward appearance gives any hint that tragedy has stalked its existence, that it's known to historians as the conjured chest. Two decades before the Civil War, the family of one Jacob Cooley lived a sumptuous life as wealthy Southern planters. Jacob owned many slaves and farmed thousands of acres. He was also an evil, despicable man who frequently beat his slaves for the slightest infraction of his stringent rules. Jacob Cooley ordered one of his slaves, an excellent furniture maker named Hosea, to construct a chest that would be used for his firstborn child. For some unknown reason, Jacob was angered at Hosea's finished product and beat him so savagely he died a few days later. Cooley's slaves, led by an old conjure man, placed a curse on the chest for all future generations. One drawer was sprinkled with dried owl's blood and a conjure chant was sung. All those associated with the chest would fall within the curse's evil power. Although Jacob Cooley himself evidently escaped the malevolence, his descendants were not as fortunate. The baby for whom the chest was originally built died soon after birth. The chest was in his nursery. His brother inherited the chest and he was stabbed to death by his personal servant. Jacob Cooley had another son, John, who inherited one of his father's many plantations. The young man led a serene bachelor's life until a vivacious young woman, barely out of her teens, came into his life. Her name was Ellie, and she soon married John nearly three times her age. The couple inherited the conjured chest. Knowing of the tragedies that had befallen her husband's siblings, she put the chest in an attic. Meanwhile, Jacob Cooley's youngest daughter, Melinda, eloped with a waggish Irishman named Sean. With nowhere to live, Melinda turned to Ellie. John and Ellie had done well and had accumulated several farms in Tennessee. They turned over one of these to Sean and Melinda to work. While Melinda bore her young husband a brood of children and worked from sunrise to sunset, Sean came to loathe the dullness of farm life. Ellie Cooley tried to help, but Sean's rebuffs made her presence unwelcome. To try and bring some beauty into Melinda's dreary existence, Ellie sent over her father-in-law's chest. It had been in her attic for a very long time and nothing had happened. She'd almost forgotten the chest's legacy. Perhaps the curse was only a lot of talk. Within days, Sean deserted his wife for the bright lights of New Orleans. Melinda was inconsolable. She took to her bed with an ailment. There, Melinda soon died, an exhausted, gray-haired woman barely out of her thirties. Shortly after his wife's death, Sean was struck in the head by a steamboat's gangplank and died. The conjure chest had claimed its third and fourth victims. The couple left many orphaned children. John Cooley was given the job of traveling to Tennessee to assign the youngsters to other family members. The youngest, a baby named Evelyn, ran up to him, her tiny arms outstretched. John took her to live with his own family in Kentucky. Little Evelyn grew into a beautiful and intelligent young woman. 
When she turned 16, Evelyn passed an examination that provided her with a teaching certificate, with which she took over a one-room schoolhouse. She met and married a Scotsman, Malcolm Johnson, barely two months after she began teaching. As a wedding present, Ellie presented her niece with Jacob Cooley's handsome chest, and the evil passed to a new generation. Evelyn Johnson had children and even adopted a young orphan, a girl named Arabella. The curse was all but forgotten. Evelyn had the chest but didn't find it necessary to use right away. However, after Arabella married some years later, Evelyn put the girl's bridal gown in the chest. Shortly thereafter, Arabella's husband suddenly died. That was the beginning of a series of horrible events visited upon Evelyn and Ellie. Arabella's child died after her baby clothes had been put in the chest. Evelyn's daughter-in-law, Esther, married to her oldest son, put her wedding attire in the chest. She died. Evelyn's Aunt Sarah knitted a scarf and gloves to give to her son for Christmas. While walking along a train trestle, he fell off and was killed a few days before Christmas. Two other tragedies befell Evelyn's immediate family. A son-in-law deserted his wife and a child was crippled for life in a bizarre accident. Yet Evelyn's husband, Malcolm, was a success. A small man, always courteous to those around him, he parlayed a shrewd Scottish sense of thrift into a burgeoning business empire that, at its height, consisted of mills, houses, a coal yard, wharf, and a dry goods store. Malcolm was an extraordinarily wealthy man when he died. Despite her material comfort, his wife was haunted by the memories of those around her who were struck down or stricken in some other way by hardship. She took her own life. Eleven persons. The conjure chest was taking its toll. As the 20th century unfolded, the chest was inherited by Virginia Carey Hudson from her grandmother Evelyn Johnson. Mrs. Hudson thought tales of the curse were just hearsay. She was wrong. Her first baby's clothes were put into the chest. She died. Another child's clothes were tucked in a drawer, and she contacted infantile paralysis. Another daughter's wedding dress was stored there, and her first husband ran off. A son was stabbed in the hand. He had clothes in the chest. A friend of the family put hunting clothes in it, he was shot in a hunting accident. And so it went. Sixteen victims, all of whom had one thing in common. Some of their personal clothing had been put in the conjure chest. Mrs. Hudson wanted to put an end to the curse. She found what she had hoped would be the solution in the form of an old friend of hers, an African-American woman named Annie. Annie understood curses and conjures, The spell cast by Hosea's faithful companions would be broken only when three conditions were met. First, Mrs. Hudson would have to be given a dead owl without her having to ask for one. Second, the green leaves of a willow tree had to be boiled from sun up to sun down. The dead owl had to remain in sight. Third, the boiled liquid was then to be buried in a jug with its handle facing east toward the rising sun below a flowering bush. A stuffed owl given to Mrs. Hudson's son by a friend accomplished the first requirement. Mrs. Hudson plucked leaves from a nearby willow tree and boiled them in a large black pot. The owl kept watch from a kitchen counter. At dusk, old Annie and Mrs. Hudson took the jug and, with its handle pointed east, buried it beneath a flowering lilac bush outside the kitchen window. Annie said they would only know if the curse had been broken if one of them died before the first full days of fall. Annie died in early September, the 17th and last known victim. The final private owner of the conjure chest was Mrs. Hudson's daughter, Virginia C. Maine. Though she may have been skeptical of the curse and knew fully the story of the curse being lifted by Annie and her mother, She never stored anything in the chest and kept it hidden in her attic. The Kentucky History Museum has it now. Mrs. Maine donated it to the museum in 1976. 
According to museum registrar Mike Hudson, the chest is in storage in our vaults, awaiting the time when it fits into a new exhibit. Supposedly, the curse has been removed. But has it? Tucked safely in the top chest drawer is an envelope with a cluster of owl feathers inside. The museum isn't taking any chances. On 17th Street in Tuscaloosa, there is a home that is hailed as the most haunted in the state of Alabama. It is called the Drish House, which was formerly known as Monroe Place. Built mostly by slaves for John Drish and his wife on a plot of 450 acres, it was a beautiful home, styled in both the Greek and Italian Renaissance style. However, as beautiful as it was, darkness from its past marred its beauty. The owner, John Drish, already had a sad, morbid history when the house was built. He was a doctor and was married to a woman named Catherine Washington. They had a daughter named Catherine. Sadly, his wife died when their daughter was young. He sent her to live in Virginia with relatives because he believed living with a widower would not be good for her. John Drish was allegedly a charming man, and it didn't take long for him to woo and marry a rich widow by the name of Sarah Owen in 1825. He brought his daughter Catherine back to Alabama to live with him, but their relationship was frayed, so much so that a story of cruelty surrounds them. Allegedly, Catherine fell in love with a man John didn't approve of. He locked her in her room with very little food and water, and she eventually relented. She later married only to bring her sons back to the Drish house. She had divorced their father. Many rumors suggest that Catherine suffered from mental illness. Though charming, John Drish was an alcoholic, and he suffered from a violent temper. Sadly, John Drish would die because of that. There are three stories surrounding his death. The first is he threw himself from a second-floor balcony. The second is that he was drunk and fell down the stairs. And the third story alleges that he was trying to stop drinking and began to shake from withdrawals and fell. Regardless of which story is true, John Drish died in 1867, leaving his distraught wife to plan his funeral. Sarah was so distraught that she became more and more eccentric. She planned an elaborate funeral. When it was over, she kept her husband's funeral candles and hid them away. She insisted that they be burned at her funeral. When she died in 1884, no one could find the candles, so her wishes were not met. Sadly, these were not the only dark things to surround the Drish family. Dr. Drish's niece was murdered by her husband, and there was also a rumor that a runaway slave hid in one of the towers, but when he exited because he needed food, he was returned to his owner who burned him alive. There have been reports of a male ghost who is assumed to be this slave. Since Sarah's death, the house has been used as a school, a church, salvage yard, an auto parts store, and was also reportedly a prison during the Civil War. Besides the male ghost, ghost lights have also been reported near the top of the house and what appears to be a ghostly fire shooting from the third-story tower. Of course, there is no fire when the firemen arrive. This occurrence is either blamed on the ghost of the slave or Sarah Drish, who is believed to be angry because her wishes of using her husband's funeral candles at her own funeral were not met. Though the house fell in disrepair for a while, it has been restored and it's now open for those who wish to hold events there. So there is hope that the dark history of the Drish house is gone and can now have a bright future. Coming up, drivers are reporting strange ghostly orbs following them on dark roads. We'll look at a few haunted roads and spook lights. First, though, we will continue with Murder by Experts in just a moment when Weird Darkness Retro Radio returns. (laughs) 
Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Roads have always seemed to attract about them tales of the strange and unusual. They push out further and further ahead of us, their destinations not visible, mysterious as the landscape rushes by us, sometimes bringing with it bizarreness. It is perhaps this almost primal sense of oddness that has spawned countless tales of haunted roads, inhabited by all manner of strange entities and apparitions. One feature of some spooky haunted roads are ghost lights, also called spook lights, dancing and twirling in the dark to baffle and amaze, and sometimes they seem to be far from harmless. Some malevolent spook lights seem to be linked to some sort of phantom motorists, and perhaps one of the more well-known of these is said to prowl a rural road in the town of Switzerland in St. John's County, Florida in the United States. Here there is a modest little road called Greenbrier Road, which runs just east of the main town, and there have for years been tales of a rather aggressive spook light that stalks vehicles that dare to drive along here at night. The enigmatic light is typically said to look just like a motorcycle headlight, which will pull up behind cars and steadily catch up no matter how fast the car goes, growing even larger in the rearview mirrors of the startled drivers. The light of the Greenbrier Road will then either chase the car until it is gone or bizarrely perch itself atop the vehicle, sort of piggybacking the car for some distance before blinking out of existence, as if it were never there at all. In some cases, the mysterious light has even been blamed for causing crashes alongside this lonely stretch of road. The most common origin story for this mysterious light is that it is the wraith of a doomed motorcyclist who died along the road when he was decapitated after running into a telephone pole wire, and that he now terrorizes the stretch upon which he met his fate, with only the headlight of his phantom bike visible. One witness named Todd M. gave his story to the Weird U.S. website, saying, A few years ago, I went to see Greenbrier Road at night with three of my friends. We had heard the stories about that light that people see and we wanted to see it. We drove up and down the road for like 40 minutes trying to see something but never saw anything until we got ready to leave. My friend Tom was driving and he looked in the rearview mirror and said, What's that? He looked behind us and there was the headlight of a motorcycle coming up fast. We slowed down a little and thought the biker would pass us, but then, just as it got right behind us about a hundred feet, the light went out. There was no motorcycle or anything. We turned around and went back but didn't see anything. I really think we saw a ghost biker of that guy that was killed on his motorcycle on that road. The malignant Greenbrier ghost light is so well known in the area that it has been the target of paranormal investigations and even scientific studies and police investigations trying to find a rational explanation for what people are seeing, but no explanation has ever been found. Speaking of phantom motorcyclists, there is another similar spook said to haunt a remote stretch of road winding through the rural farming county of Exeter in Tulare County, California, which is supposedly the stomping ground of a similar ghost. In this case, 
In the 1950s, a group of friends allegedly decided to play a prank on one of their friends by stretching out some rope across a narrow road called Bardsley Road in the Fresno Valley, after which they lied in wait for their motorcycle-riding pal to come cruising by on his way home from work. The plan was for the rope to just hit him in the chest and knock him off his bike, which was pretty mean, but they didn't intend to seriously hurt him, certainly not kill him. The story goes that the rider came along the darkened road, as expected, and also hit the rope just as expected. What wasn't expected was that the rope would be too high and lop his head clean off to go rolling across the pavement. In the aftermath of the gruesome accident, people started occasionally claiming to see a bright light shooting up and down the road, sometimes accompanied by the sound of a motorcycle engine and with the full apparition of a headless rider visible as well. Motorists and people walking along the road at night have also told of being followed or even chased by the phantom motorcyclist, and it's believed that if you encounter the rider, you will be cursed to be in an accident yourself. Adding to these is a headless rider said to prowl Creek Road of Ojai, California, apparently riding a vintage 1940s motorcycle and appearing as a glowing light at first, often pulling right up next to motorists to bang on their vehicles or chase them. Interestingly, Creek Road is ground zero for all manner of ghostly phenomena and high strangeness, including at least two phantom horse riders, numerous apparitions, a smoking, horribly burned and disfigured entity called the Char Man, and even a supposed vampire, making a headless motorcycle rider actually one of the less bizarre tales from this place. Other sinister spook lights seem to be malevolent spirits or even possibly demons. Located out just northeast of Jacksonville, Florida, is St. George Island, which is home to a historic sugarcane, cotton, and corn plantation from the slave days called Kingsley Plantation, established by a man named Zephaniah Kingsley in 1813. The original plantation would quickly grow until Kingsley owned around a total of 32,000 acres of land and employed about 200 slaves. Despite having so many slaves, Kingsley was known for being a very lax and kind slave master, allowing his workforce to basically do whatever they wanted when they were off duty and they were allowed to sell any crafts they made on their own time. Kingsley even married one of his slaves, Anna Magajean Jai, who would go on to take a prominent management role on the plantation, own her own land, and end up being one of the richest women in the state. Although conditions were much better for slaves on the Kingsley Plantation than they were elsewhere, there was some amount of tragedy on the plantation nevertheless. At some point, one of the slaves allegedly took to beating and raping other female slaves, even, according to the stories, murdering a few and hiding their bodies in the wilderness. When the other slaves got wind of this grim behavior, they are said to have gathered up a lynch mob to hunt the perpetrator down and had him strung up and hanged on a massive, spooky-looking oak tree right in front of the plantation along the main road to the premises, leaving his lifeless body to swing there in the wind. Although Kingsley would move to Haiti along with all of his slaves in 1837, it seems that at least some of them remained, in a macabre sense. Over the years, the Kingsley Plantation has come to gather quite a reputation for being intensely haunted, supposedly by the ghosts of those murdered here. One is a woman in white that is frequently spotted roaming around and has a habit of photobombing pictures taken at the locale while another is an unearthly screaming or wailing that supposedly emanates from the old abandoned well on the property, said to be from a victim of the crime spree whose body was unceremoniously dumped down there in the darkness. However, one of the most frightening of the spirits of the old Kingsley Plantation is supposedly the vindictive spirit of the mad slave murderer himself who terrorizes the plantation's creepy and rugged, unpaved road. This particularly malicious spirit typically takes the form of two malevolent, angry-looking red lights 
said to be his glowing eyes, earning the Phantom the name Old Red Eyes. These lights will supposedly appear right behind cars, right about at the old oak tree, and chase them, in some reports even relentlessly attacking them. One report of an encounter with Old Red Eyes was described by a witness thus. I saw Old Red Eyes several years ago. I have a friend that lives just off of that road and had taken him home from Jacksonville one night. It was about midnight, and after driving him off, I was driving back down that road to the hard road and looked in the side mirror on my car and saw two red lights. At first, I thought it was the taillights of another car, but they were too close together. I slowed down a little and watched them in the mirror, and it looked like they were coming closer. I knew that I had not passed another car, and it did not seem like a car would be coming down that dark road backwards. I stopped and stuck my head out the window and looked back, and there was nothing there. Then I looked in the mirror again, and there they were, and they were right behind my car. I gunned it and got the hell out of there. What I saw wasn't a car. Just as ominous is the appropriately named Demon's Road in Huntsville, Texas, which is already spooky enough. As it meanders through groves of twisted trees and darkened woods, and ends up at the desolate Martha's Chapel Cemetery. The real name is Bowden Road, but it has earned its nickname in the decidedly frightening phenomena that have been reported from there, such as shadow people, a ghostly child with glowing eyes on a tricycle, a hulking, faceless beast, a strange hooded figure, and arms reaching out from graves. There are many spirits said to lurk along the murky stretches of this road and in the cemetery, but one of the creepiest is a ghost light that seems to be quite malicious indeed. Motorists venturing down the Demon's Road have often reported mysterious red lights hovering about in the dark, the number of which seem to depend on how many people are in the vehicle at the time. These spook lights will supposedly aggressively pursue cars and, spookiest of all, will leave unexplained handprints on the outside. Indeed, these lights have plagued many who have traveled down the road, often leaving those handprints and always hostile, sometimes even clawing or grabbing at cars to leave scratches and dents behind. What could this diabolical force be, and why does it want to attack vehicles? nobody knows. More haunted roads and ghostly lights when Weird Darkness returns. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. We now return to Murder by Experts and The Big Money from July 25th, 1949. Well, Philo made a print of my index finger and little Mr. Peebles squinted at it, then at the print in the history book. He spent at least five minutes doing it, mumbling to himself. This is an important moment, very important moment near me. Yes... Yes, I'm sure of it. The Prince Match. You are Howard Vincent. Congratulations, my boy. Congratulations. Of course the Prince Matched. Philo had faked that print in the history book a month before. I was in. The big money at last. Seven million dollars. Yes, seven, not three and a half. I didn't have any more idea of splitting with Philo than of flying to the moon. 
Naturally, I didn't tell him that. Not yet. I sort of got the feel of things first. I settled into being Howard Vincent very, very quietly. You know how the big money works. Hush, hush. That's how I wanted it. But pretty soon, I felt as if I'd been Howard Vincent all my life. And I began to enjoy it. But I couldn't put Philo off forever. And the showdown came one morning in my plushy private office at the very top of the Vincent building. Philo and Marlene were both there. And they got down to business fast. Well, George, you've adapted yourself to wealth very quickly. Enjoying yourself, eh? I certainly am, Philo. I always knew I was meant for this kind of life. It seems to come natural to me. I believe I could get used to it myself. Which brings up the matter of uh, my split. Of course, Philo, but it'll take time. It has to be arranged. Very smoothly arranged. Oh, we understand that, George. It isn't that Uncle Philo distrusts you. He'd just hate to have a misunderstanding spoil our friendship. It's a big job turning over half the estate without anyone getting suspicious. Of course it is, my boy. Of course it is. And I'm going to give you two years to do it in. Three, if you think necessary. But I will want monthly installments of at least uh, $50,000 until the final settlement. $50,000 a month, but Philo... Oh, George, that isn't so very much. Out of all the millions you'd never have had but for Uncle Philo. Oh, all right. You win. 50000 a month. I'm glad you're seeing it my way. And now that that is settled, we won't be meeting again, George. We won't? Why not? Uncle Philo means he'll feel safer if he's where you can't try to kill him, George. Kill him? That's ridiculous. I wouldn't dream of any such thing, Philo. You know that. Of course I do, my boy. Especially since as soon as I leave here, I intend to write out a complete account of this interesting affair and leave it with a friend to be forwarded to the police if anything violent should happen to me. Now, that's not necessary, Philo. Nevertheless, I shall feel better when it's done. Marlene, my dear, shall we go now? In a minute, Uncle Philo. I want to powder my nose first. I'll be right back. No hard feelings, I hope, George. It's only good business, you know, to take precautions. Of course there's no hard feelings. I'm still making out pretty good. Here, let me ring for the elevator for you. You might as well ride down in my private car. A private elevator? Well, great wealth has its privileges, as I hope to find out. Funny. I push the button, but I don't hear the car coming. Perhaps it's already at this floor. Uh, try the door. All right, I will. Well, how do you like that? The door opens, but the elevator isn't here. The shaft is empty. Oh, that's very odd. There's something wrong with the mechanism. The door shouldn't open if the car... George, George, what are you doing? What are you grabbing me for? Let go of me, George! No! 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 I shoved hard, and Philo went down the elevator shaft, clawing at empty air and moving his feet like a ballet dancer. His scream coming back to me, channeled upwards by the shaft. He screamed, and then he stopped. Yes, there was something wrong with the elevator, all right. I discovered it that morning, but I hadn't reported it. Instead, I'd sent for Philo and Marlene for this showdown. Now Philo was disposed of. Accidentally, with no comeback at me. I only had to take care of Marlene. I closed the elevator door and stood there, trying to act calm, but the perspiration was popping out on my brow. They'd find Philo in a moment. Was it Marlene ever coming back? Then she came. Well, here I am. But, George, where's Uncle Philo? Yeah, he's in the elevator. Uh, I'm going down with you. We'll stop at the bank. I'm making a small advance payment. In the elevator? Oh, all right. Open the door, George. Go on, open it. She wasn't close enough. I had to stall. Get her closer. The uh, door seems to be stuck. Give me a hand, Marlene. Ah, uh, no, thank you, George. I'd rather not. But, Marlene... Stay I... right there, George. Don't come any closer. You see, darling, I have a nice ladylike gun in my purse. Marlene, what is this? A gag? No, I didn't powder my nose, George. I found I'd forgotten my compact, and I came back. I was outside the door when I heard you talking about the elevator, and then Uncle Philo screamed. Poor Uncle Philo. I thought he was smarter than that. So did he. But he wasn't. A baby could have taken care of Philo. Well, go on. Grab the phone. Call the cops. I could. But what good would that do either of us? I don't get you. 
Uncle Philo is dead. I can't help him any. But you're not dead. And I can't help you. Jeez, what are you leading up to, Marlene? I know you murdered Uncle Philo. But you'd be safe. And I couldn't testify against you. If you married me, George. Maybe Marlene had a baby voice, but her mind was like a steel trap. Sure, I married her. She had the whip hand. She helped me cover up Philo's death as an accident. Then she moved in and took over. Oh, it's nice to be rich, isn't it, George? Poor Uncle Philo. How he would have loved all this. I thought we agreed to forget Philo. Oh, we did, didn't we? All right, I'll change the subject then. I saw a dream of a diamond necklace at Carter's today. No, I won't buy it. You're spending money as if I had all the dough in the world. Marlene, I'll... You'll do nothing, George. Please sit down and stop clenching your hands. You know you're never going to touch me. If anything should ever happen to me, and I mean anything, a friend will send a complete account of this impersonation of yours to the police. So you're going to take good care of me, darling. And that being the case, why don't we be friends? I'm not such bad company. Am I, George? No, Marlene wasn't bad company. She was very good company when she wanted to be. And that written account to go to the cops if anything happened to her protected her better than a bodyguard could have. So I made the best of it. We got along all right. Except that Marlene spent money like crazy. Until one night on our private terrace, 20 stories up, with a bottle of Napoleon brandy open between us, I began to feel sleepy. Very sleepy. Too sleepy. I tried to stand up, and I couldn't. I flopped back in the deck chair like a rag doll. And Marlene stood up and leaned over me. George? George? Huh? What is it? Why don't you go inside instead of falling asleep out here on the terrace? Go inside? Yeah, that's a good idea. I tried to stand up again. This time, with Marlene's help, I made it. She stood very close while I wobbled to keep my balance. And I knew she'd put something in the brandy. Liquor by itself couldn't have done that to me. Marlene! Marlene! Yes, George? What'd you put in the brandy? Just a few drops of something, George, dear. Steady. (laughs) Mustn't fall, not yet. We're not close enough to the railing. What are you up to? You've never stopped trying to find a way to be rid of me, have you, George? But you'll never succeed because I can make plans, too. And I've made my plans to be your widow. That's that's crazy. You can't get away with it. Oh, of course I can. You're going to have an accident. You're going to fall 20 floors from this balcony to the nice hard street. Now, come over here, George. Another step. That's right. No, I I won't. You, You can't. No, but I can. What I put in the brandy has made you helpless as a baby. Matthew the butler will testify how drunk you were. George... Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. George, let go of my wrist. You can make plans. George, let me go. But you overestimated how far gone I was. I'm pretty wobbly, but not wobbly enough for you to push me over any rail. I was just joking with you, George. I was just trying to scare you. Let go of me. Oh, no, you don't. George. We're going inside. (laughs) I'm going to teach you a little lesson. Stop struggling. It won't do you any good. George, let go of me. Marlene. Marlene, look out. Marlene. She was gone. She went the same route Philo had taken. But this time, I'd have given both arms to save her. I stood there trying to get hold of myself, and behind me, I heard the French door open. I turned. It was Matthew, the butler, gargling at me. Mr. Vincent. Mr. Vincent. Matthew. You saw. Saw her try to push me over, didn't you? You saw her try to push me and slip and go over herself? Saw her try to push you over? Mr. Vincent, sir, I saw you murder your wife. That's the story. You, Mr. Peebles, and all you others. I sure had you fooled. (laughs) Howard Vincent. That's a laugh. I was born in the gutters, but born for the big money, and I had it, even if it didn't last. After what Matthews told you, I know you'll never believe I didn't kill Marlene. And with those documents Marlene left to be turned over to the cops, well, I guess I've come to the end of the road. 
But you can't get the big money without paying for it somehow, can you? Oh, Howard. Howard, my boy. Yes, Mr. Peebles? Marlene didn't leave any documents. She didn't? But she said... Oh, that was just an effort to keep her hold over you. You see, shortly after we accepted you as Howard Vincent, we found a box of your boyhood toys... And among them was a paint box covered with fingerprints in dried paint. Then why didn't you nab me? Why'd you let me get away with it? Because they were your fingerprints. My boy, this was all so unnecessary. You are and always have been Howard Vincent. And so the curtain falls on the big money, which was chosen by guest expert Francis Crane, whose latest mystery, The Flying Red Horse, has just been published. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of a murderer whose victim refused to stay dead, selected for your approval by Cornell Woolrich. Until then, this is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us next week at this time. The Big Money was written by Philip Andrews and adapted for radio by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. In the cast were James Stevens, Anne Shepard, Eric Dressler, and Wendell Holmes. Music is under the direction of Sylvan Levin and was composed by Richard U. Page. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. All characters in our story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. This is Jack Farron speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Right around the corner, we have Escape with the Vessel of Wrath from May 10th, 1953, coming up on Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Algernon Blackwood's novella The Willows was originally published as part of Blackwood's 1907 collection The Listener and Other Stories. It is one of his best-known works and has been influential on a number of later writers. In fact, horror author H. P. Lovecraft considered the story The Willows to be the finest supernatural tale in English literature. And you can hear the story The Willows by Algernon Blackwood absolutely free. Visit the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com to find it. The Willows by Algernon Blackwood at WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. More haunted roads and ghostly lights in just a few minutes, but right now it's Escape and the Vessel of Wrath from May 10th, 1953, on Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are on a paradise island, living in happiness and freedom, while the woman who loathes you for what you are is planning to take away your freedom and forever put an end to your happy life. Listen now as Escape brings you Somerset Mom's unusual story, The Vessel of Wrath.
As I sit here with the sea-cooled breezes coming into the open window and the sounds of the breakers washing the sands before my house, I think of the far places and the people I have known there. In particular, I think of the thing that happened in the train of islands known as the Alas Group, which is a fair distance from Java. It extends about 75 miles east and west and 40 miles north and south. At a certain moment of the world's history, the controller of the principal island, which is called Baru, was Mynheer Everett Gruter. And he ruled the people who inhabited the Alas Islands with firmness, tempered by a keen sense of the ridiculous. He was very short and extremely fat, and he had twinkling blue eyes. He knew that he had no dignity in his form, but for the sake of his position, he made up for it by dressing very dapperly. One morning in the early heat of summer, his head boy came into his bedroom while he was dressing. What is it? Dwar Jones, mine here. He wishes to see you. Oh, what an unholy hour for a holy man to call. Yes, mine you. Very well. Ask the tuan to wait and say I shall come directly. Tuan Jones was the Reverend Owen Jones in charge of the Baptist mission on the Alice Islands. His headquarters were also on the island of Baru. He was a tall, thin, melancholy man with a long face, sallow and drawn, of about 40. He lived with his sister in a little white house about a half mile from the village. She was about the same age as her brother and bore a remarkable resemblance. Mr. Gruter both disliked and respected the Reverend Mr. Jones, disliked him because he was narrow-minded and dogmatic, respected him because he was honest and good and the only qualified doctor in the group. At any event, Mr. Guter buttoned up his tunic, went into the sitting room. Reverend Owen Jones got up. Uh, good morning, Mr. Jones. Have you come in to have a peg with me before I start my day's work? I've come to see you upon a very distressing matter, Mr. Guter. Oh. Uh, sit down, my dear fellow, and have a cigar. Uh, thank you, no. I neither smoke nor drink, Mr. Guter. Yes, of course. How could I forget? Uh, please, sit down, Mr. Jones. What can I do for you? I've come to see you about the man they call Ginger Ted. I want to know what you're going to do about him. Why, what has happened? It's disgraceful. There was a disgraceful row in one of the Chinese shops last night. Ginger Ted wrecked the place and half killed the owner. Drunk again, I suppose? Naturally. When is he anything else? It took six men to get him to jail. Well, he is a hefty fellow. He must be deported from these islands, Mr. Gruter. Absolutely must. Oh? The man's presence is a public scandal. He's never sober from morning to night. And as for his behavior with the native women... <laughs> yes. Well, Mr. Gruter, you know this man's transgressions just as well as I do. It's grown steadily worse ever since he came here. Now he has really overstepped the limit. I beg you to use your power and turn him out once and for all. Uh, it is time for me to go to my office, Mr. Jones. I shall see what must be done. I wish you good morning. A few minutes later, Mr. Gruter was in his office, where he immediately called for Ginger Ted to be brought before him. The man was led in with the water on either side. They left him standing there. He swayed a little, and obviously was suffering from a furious hangover. <sighs> He had a black eye, and his mouth was cut and swollen. And Mr. Gruter was quite upset, for this unappetizing object had shared many a bottle of beer with him, mm. and he liked the reckless way in which Ginger Ted squandered the priceless treasure of life. Mm. He looked at the tarred sheet before him. I see that you smashed up Lumwang's shop to smithereens, then proceeded to break his head with a bottle, mm. resisted arrest, and knocked flat the sergeant. What have you to say for yourself? I was blind. I don't remember a thing about it. Oh, oh my head. They say I half killed him. I suppose I did. I'll, I'll pay the damage if they give me time. You will, Ginger, but it's me who will give you time. You are a disgrace. Incorrigible. You have kicked up row after row. Uh, I can see it is hopeless. You know I meant no harm. That is what you always say. Look here, why can't you behave yourself? We are friends, aren't we? Of course we are. Well, you have made a devil of a mess this time, and the Reverend Jones is all for having you kicked out. Oh. I have got to do something about it, or he will write to the governor in Batavia. No, And he, he is quite right. You have got to be punished. 
I'm sentencing you to six months on Mapatiti. Oh. Hard labor. Oh. All right. Now, how about a bottle of beer with me before you go? You look as though you need it. It's the truth, I do. You're a pal, Mr. Gruter. Ginger Ted took his sentence with good grace. One, he knew he had overstepped the bounds, and two, there were several rather delightful native girls on the island of Maputiti that he had not seen for several months. He bore the controller no malice for his punishment, and he was sent to pay his debt. The six months had passed but for a few days when chance stepped in. The head man of Maputiti was stricken with a sudden illness. Messengers were sent to Baru, 50 miles across the sea, and help was begged of the missionary, the Reverend Mr. Jones. But Mr. Jones was at that moment enduring an attack of malaria. He was in bed and talked the matter over with his sister. It sounds as though the head man had acute appendicitis. You can't go, Owen. You can't. Well, I, I can't let the man die. But you couldn't operate in the state you're in. No, no, I, I, I suppose not, but I... I'll do it. You can't remove an appendix. Why not? I've seen you do it. You've done lots of minor operations. I can't allow it. it. It's too dangerous. They wouldn't understand. A woman, no, no, you... I'm going and that's all there is to it. <laughs> And so Miss Jones went by launch to Mapotiti. She performed the operation on the headman under the greatest difficulties, and it is to her everlasting credit that she saved his life. And when she saw that he was well on the mend, she packed up the medicine chest and was taken down to the wharf where she embarked on the launch to take her back to Baru. On the out journey, she had been the only passenger, but now there was another, Ginger Ted. He had paid his debt to society and was returning for another chance. The crew consisted of the head boatman and a mechanic, both native. They were about 30 miles out in the open sea when Ginger Ted took the stopper out of a bottle of arrack and took a long pull. Oh, chum. How's about a swig? Thank you, Ginger. Boatman, I do not wish you to drink anything while we're on the journey. Do you understand? Yes. Oh, yes. <sighs> A little air act can do no one any harm. <laughs> Thank you. If you drink again, I shall complain to the controller. <laughs> Miss Jones knew they were being extremely rude at her expense, and she closed her thin lips even more tightly. Her long, bony face became grim. They went due east, and the sun set radiantly behind one of the small islands. The sea was like glass... And Miss Jones suddenly felt her heart filled with gratitude for the beauty of the world. It was then that there was a lurch, and the launch began to vibrate, and the engine rattled. Oi! What's up? Propeller, Ginger. We scrape free. Do we make it back to Baru tonight? Better we not. Better we stop at Ireland and fix. Right. Oi, miss. We're going to have to put over at the little island over there. Put out a new propeller in the morning when the tide's out. That's impossible. I can't spend the night on an uninhabited island with three men. A lot of women would jump at it. How dare you speak to me like that? I think you're very insolent. If you don't go on to Baru, I'll have you all put in prison. Now, look here. We're not going to Baru. We can't. The engine breaks down all the way. Who knows where we'll drift to? Now, if you don't like it, you can get out and swim. Oh, you'll... You'll pay for this. Oh, shut up, you old cow. From then on, Ginger Ted was occupied with the rather tricky job of beaching the launch. Miss Jones sat quivering with indignation, and then, as the full meaning of what lay before her dawned, her anger turned to fear. I see it all now. I see it all. There's nothing at all the matter with the propeller. He wants to get me ashore, where he has me at his will. To do his worst. Oh, I know his character. Despicable, horrid. And there can be no help from the natives. He's bribed them to help. But I must have courage. I shall sell my virtue dearly. Dearly. And if he kills me, then I should rather die than... And in her fear, she removed a scalpel from the surgical instrument she had so lately used to save her life and hid it in her clothing. Then they were ashore, 
And the night came. Ginger Ted did his best. Oi, miss. Come on over to the fire. We've got some lovely grub here. A nip of addict won't hurt you neither. I want nothing. I want to be left alone. Oh, you can go to the devil then. Go hungry. Don't mean nothing to me. How'd you like this? It's like a nice and hot air. She walked away with head erect, the scalpel held tightly in her fist. And though she was looking for a place to hide, a place of safety, her instinct told her it was better to keep that bad man in sight. And then if he came toward her, she would be prepared. The moonlight would show him to her. Presently she found a little hollow and sank down into it where in the distance she saw the warm glow of the fire and the huddled, dreadful shapes of men around it. He's plotting it now. He's making them drink. So they'll sleep soundly. I'm afraid. I'm so afraid. Oh. But if that horrible, loathsome man makes a step, comes near, I'll kill him. I'll kill him. <laughs> We will return to escape in just a moment. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, I just grab one of my Built Bars, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving, despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert, or even a meal like breakfast, with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. We'll continue with our story, The Vessel of Wrath, on Escape in just a moment. Up first, though, a few more stories about ghost lights and haunted roads. Another case in Texas of an aggressive ghost light is that said to roam a road in Hardin County, leading from Bragg to Saratoga, which actually at one point was a part of the Santa Fe Railroad back in the early 1900s, before being paved over to be turned into a road. In an area called Big Thicket, there have long been reports of a multicolored spook light hovering about at night along the road and in the surrounding wilderness, with many of them pointing at the light being quite evil. Even from the beginning, the reports of the Big Thicket ghost light also called the Saratoga ghost light, were far from friendly. Hunters reported being chased by the lights, and it was not uncommon to hear of them rushing amongst horses to send the animals into a panicked frenzy, to the point that on at least one occasion a horse-drawn wagon was forced to go crashing into a ditch because of the lights. At the time, the lights became a pretty widespread rumor attracting all sorts of curiosity seekers, and author F. E. Abernathy would explain the phenomenon in his book Tales from the Big Thicket thus. Light seers poured onto the road by the hundreds. People of all ages and intellects came to see and test their beliefs in the supernatural. They shot at it, they chased it, and they tested it with litmus paper and Geiger counters. A preacher harangued the road's multitudes from the top of his car, making the light as an ill omen of the world's impending doom. There were some nights the light didn't show at all, but for the most part it was there to inspire stories that could be passed on. 
to change and grow at the will and imagination of the storyteller. In later years, the light did not stop its antics in the slightest bit, with reports of it chasing people or even attacking them common, such as cases in which the light stopped car engines, burned people's hands, or even violently knocked them down. There have been reports of cars being dinged, dented, or smashed by the ghost light, and it is generally not something one wants to encounter while driving down the already eerie rural road. As usual, there have been many attempts to rationally explain the big thicket light, such as that it is some sort of illusion, swamp gas, or merely headlights, and there have been a fair number of more paranormal explanations as well, including that it is the spirit of a hunter or Civil War soldier, or even that it is a curse placed over a lost Spanish treasure. Whatever the case may be, the stories of the evil ghost light of Saratoga persist. Texas seems to be a haven for such spook lights because there is another road in this state that has its own scary stories of such entities. In the area of Mitchell Flat, east of Marfa, Texas, there have long been reports of mystery lights floating out over the desert landscape since at least the 1800s. The phenomena are usually described as dancing orbs of light that zip and zoom low to the ground over the parched desert scrub, and they have collectively been coined the Marfa Lights. While the phenomenon is puzzling but usually harmless and distant, there have been some reports that show these lights can be rather frightening on occasion. In one report from Weir, Texas, One man named Tim Stevens gave an account of a very bizarre experience, witnessed by a friend of his father's named Roy while traveling down Route 90 in the 1970s. According to the report, Roy had been driving for hours out from San Antonio after sunset and just before dark, and there had been no other cars out in this remote stretch of the highway that evening. Suddenly, he noticed what he took to be headlights in his rearview mirror, For some time, the lights remained a comfortable distance away, but at some point the lights quickly closed the distance to follow right behind him. The report explained the following sequence of events. My dad said that Roy had been driving up with the lights a comfortable distance behind him for several minutes when the vehicle sped up and approached his truck rapidly. For a few seconds he honestly thought he was about to be rear-ended. Before an impact occurred, however, The light stopped a few feet short of hitting his truck. At 60 miles per hour, in the middle of an otherwise deserted highway, it probably wasn't too much to ask for a courtesy of a little breathing room. So Roy tapped the brakes. The driver of the vehicle behind him maintained his distance. Roy again tapped his brakes. No response. Finally, very annoyed, Roy jammed hard on his brakes for a fraction of a second. To his amazement, the vehicle behind him stayed the exact distance from his rear bumper as it had been. Roy decided to try a different approach. He said he floored the gas pedal, making his small truck shudder and lurch ahead. The speed crept up to 80 miles per hour. The lights behind him reacted in perfect unison, staying several feet behind his truck as it approached speeds Roy was sure he'd never pushed it to before. At nearly 100 miles per hour, the truck was beginning to vibrate badly, but the lights did not waver. Enough was enough, Roy eased off the gas and let the truck coast down to a sane speed. Then he stood on the brakes. The tires screeched and smoked, and the truck pitched and slid slightly to the side, but the whole time, Roy watched the lights in the mirror. They stayed in exactly the same spot until the truck came to a stop. Roy then saw something completely unexpected. The lights shot out off the road to the right and fired across the desert like missiles. He craned his neck around to try and follow them visually, impressed by the driver's driving on what was sure to be a very rough road. He smiled and was about to drive on when a thought occurred to him. He frowned and, making sure he wasn't about to be run over by a big rig or other traffic, put his truck in reverse and slowly backed up maybe a couple hundred feet. He checked the barbed wire fence line for a road, 
a gate or other break of some kind where his pursuer may have slipped through. But there was none. Roy said he was pretty spooked, all right. Off the distance, he could see lights move swiftly across the horizon. Whatever this was, whether it was connected to the Marfa lights or not, it certainly seems hard to explain away as a trick of light or headlight reflections from the distance. Ghost lights have been a persistent phenomenon within the world of the weird, and there have been countless theories to try and explain them. Yet none seem to touch on those lights that seem to reach out from the merely mysterious to lash out at or harass those who encounter them. Is there some explanation for this? Or is this just hoaxes and tall tales? If it is indeed real, then why do these particular spook lights cling to these locations, and why do they seem so hostile and threatening? It seems to be beyond our ability to comprehend at this point, and these lights may flit about the periphery of our understanding, prowling their haunted grounds without ever being satisfactorily explained. We will return to escape in just a moment, but first, in time of accident or emergency, it helps to be in good financial condition. That's why it pays to invest in United States savings bonds. When you need money, the new 3% United States savings bond is better than ever. And now, back to Escape. It should be mentioned again that Miss Jones was a woman hard on 40. She had an odd, drooping gracefulness and was extremely flat and thin. Her features were much like her brother's, the Reverend Owen Jones, and she suffered a good deal from indigestion. But at that moment, her suffering bore a pain which was far more exquisite. What shall I do? What have I done to deserve this? And she prayed and trembled as terrible phantoms crossed her mind. And the time passed. She saw the fire at the beach die down. And now was the time that Ginger Ted might be expected to turn on the woman who was at his mercy. He smothered a cry, for suddenly he got up and walked in her direction. She clenched the scalpel more tightly. understand it. Why? 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 And then when she saw him go back to the fire and knew that for the moment at least she was spared, her nerve gave way. (laughs) After that, she felt a little better and decided to close her eyes for a moment. The strain of watching had tired them, and when she opened them again, it was morning. And with a sudden shock of fear, she found that she was covered with two copra sacks. He must have done it. He had her at his mercy, and yet... Good morning. I was just going to wake you up. There's bananas for breakfast, and you can eat them on the boat, because we fixed it. Come on. Here's a hand. Oh. Thank you. Mr. Uh... What? Nothing. I have missed you, Ginger. Here's luck. Same to you, Mr. Grutter. Well, you don't bear me any malice for the sentence I gave you, I hope? No, no, no bloody fear. I didn't have a bad time, you know. Nice lot of girls on Meputiti. You ought to give me a look over one of these days. (laughs) 
<laughs> you are a bad lot, Ginger. <laughs> oh, by the way, I've been saving your remittance from England while you are away. I took out for the damage you did, and still there is a little over 30 pounds left. That's a lot of money out here. You really ought to do something useful with it. I'm going to. Spend it. Uh, Mine here. Tuan Jones wishes to speak with you. Very important, he says. Mr. Gugler, I, I shan't detain you long. I heard that... Oh, there you are, Ginger. I've been trying to find this good man all day, Mr. Gugler. Oh. And I heard he was here. Uh, how is Miss Jones? None the worse for her night in the open, I trust? Uh, no, no, not at all. I want to thank you. Oh, me? You did a great and noble thing. Me? My sister is right. One should always look for the good in their fellow man. I have misjudged you in the past. I beg your pardon. What in the blazes are you talking about? You had my sister at your mercy and you spared her. She was defenseless in your power and you had pity on her. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Neither my sister nor I will ever forget. I, I thank you. What in bloody blue blazes does he mean? <laughs> oh, I grunt her. Hey, what's so funny? Oh, if you don't stop laughing, I'll break your bloody head open. Well, he, he's... <laughs> Ginger, he, he's thanking you for having respected the virtue of Miss Jones. What? <laughs> yeah. Me? Me? That old cow? <laughs> What does he take me for? Well, you have a reputation of being rather hot stuff with a girl, Ginger. Oh, I wouldn't touch her with the fag end of a ten-foot barge pole. Never entered my head. The ruddy nerve. I'll rig his blasted neck. Look here. Give me my money. I'm going to get drunk. I, I don't blame you. That old cow. That old cow. Here, here you are. Go and get drunk, Ginger Ted, but I warn you, if you get into mischief, it'll be 12 months next I month. shan't get in mischief, don't worry. But it's an insult, that's what it is. A bloody insult. Dirty swine. What does it take me for? Dirty swine. <laughs> Ginger Ted got drunk, then he stayed drunk for a week. His pride had been hurt. And to make matters worse, the Reverend Mr. Jones and his sister decided it was their duty to save him and do something for him. They appealed to Mr. Gruder, who said, Well, if I were you, Mr. Jones, I wouldn't try to save him until he's got through his money. Then, if he is not in jail, you can do what you like. But Ginger Ted didn't want to be saved. He spent his money and then sulked, waiting for the next remittance from London. Miss Jones was unrelenting. She invited him to dinner and spoke to Mr. Grutter about it. Oh, Mr. Grutter, my brother is very anxious that we should have the man they call Ginger Ted to supper with us. And I've written him a little note inviting him for the day after tomorrow. I think he's rather shy. I wonder if you'd come with him. Well, that is very kind of you. My brother feels that we ought to do something for him. Mm, have woman's influence and all that sort of thing. Will you persuade him to come? Well, I do my best, Miss Jones. Uh, tell me, Mr. Grutter, how old is he? According to his passport, 37. And what is his real name? Surely not Ginger Ted. Edward Wilson. Edward Wilson. Mm, yes. Edward Wilson. The controller actually persuaded Ginger Ted to join him. This on the promise of several drinks at his own house before they went to dine. But on the night of the party, Mr. Gooter had to go alone. Ginger Ted was dead drunk outside the Chinese wine and grocery shop and not fit for anything. I am very sorry, Miss Jones. I'm afraid it's no good, Martha. The man's hopeless. No, never, Owen. No one is hopeless. Everyone has some good in him. I shall pray for him every night. I shall pray that he sees the light. Perhaps Miss Jones was right in this, but the divine providence took a very funny way of effecting its ends. It came in the form of a cholera epidemic on Baru and several other of the neighboring islands, and the natives were in a panic. It was more than the Reverend Mr. Jones could handle, and it was going to need more doctors, and this would take time. Mr. Gruter held a conference with Mr. Jones and his sister. We are ready to put ourselves at your disposal, Mr. Gruter. 
I need not tell you that my sister is as competent as any man. I should be very glad of her assistance. But I am afraid it does not work for a woman. She would have to go to some of the outlying islands. We cannot possibly spare you, Mr. Jones. Then, of course, I shall go. Oh, but it might be dangerous. Some of the natives are still treacherous. You would have too much trouble with them. I'm not afraid. I dare say, but if you get your throat cut, I shall get into trouble. Besides, we are so short-handed here on Baru, I do not want to risk losing your help. Then let Mr. Wilson come with me. He knows the natives and speaks their dialect. Ginger Ted? Oh, no, he is just getting over an attack of the DTs. He has been drunk for weeks. Uh, that's out of the question. I wonder if it would be wise. After all, he... I trust him, Owen. I shall always trust him. Oh, there was a great deal I more discussion, but in the end, Ginger Ted was sent for. He looked ill. He was in rags and hadn't shaved for weeks. No one could have looked more disreputable. Look here, Ginger. It is about this cholera business. We've got to force the natives to take precautions, and uh, we want you to help us. Why the devil should I? Well, uh, it was my suggestion, Mr. Wilson. You see, I was afraid to go alone. I thought if you came, I should be safer. Well, what do you suppose I care if they cut your nutty throat? They don't mean a thing to me. There's no reason you should care, I suppose. It's all right. I'll go alone. A lot of bloody foolishness for a woman to go out there alone. I dare say, but it's my job. And I can't help myself. I'm sorry if I offended by asking you. It wasn't really fair to ask you to share such a risk, was it? All right, all right. Have it your own way. I'll come with you. When do you want to start? They started the next day with drugs and disinfectants in the government launch. For four months, the epidemic raged, and then one day it was over. Mr. Grutter had seen nothing of Ginger Ted or Miss Jones, but he had heard from Mr. Jones that they had performed a Herculean task in the outer islands. Mr. Grutter was thinking of Ginger Ted over a bottle of beer one evening when the man came in. He was wearing a clean suit of white ducks, he was shaved, he looked another man. Why, Ginger, what on earth has happened? Why, heaven, I'm glad to see you. you. You look wonderful. Here, have some beer. Man, I have missed you. Here, let me pour it. I uh, don't think I'll have any, thank you. What? I uh, don't mind having a cup of tea, though. A cup of what? I'm uh, on the wagon. Martha and I are going to be married. Ginger, you, you can't marry Miss Jones. No one could marry Miss Jones. Well, I'm going to. That's what I've come to see you about. First thing, soon as I get off the launch. We want to be married by Dutch law as well as chapel. Oh, come now. A joke is a joke, Ginger. She wanted it. She she fell for me that night we spent on the island when the propeller broke. Ginger. Ginger. She'll make you into a missionary. Well, I don't know as I'd mind if we did have a little mission of our own. She says I'm a bloody marvel with the natives. Says I can do more in five minutes with him than Owen can in a year. I guess she had an eye on you. But this... Uh, listen to me, Ginger. We have had some grand times together. And a friend is a friend. I tell you what I do. I lend you the launch and it's you can no go good, away from... Mr. Grutter. I know you mean well. But I'm going to marry the blasted woman and that's that. Do something about it, Mr. Jones. This is madness. My sister is of full age and entitled to do as she pleases. But you don't mean to tell me you approve of it. You know Ginger Ted. Ginger Ted, Mr. Jones. Have you told her the risk she is running? Does the leopard ever change his spot? My sister is a very determined woman, Mr. Grutter. From that night they spent on the island together, he never had a chance. Mr. Grutter was beaten and he knew it. Then the next day, sportingly, he went to pay his compliments to Miss Jones, who was preparing for her wedding. How nice of you to come, Mr. Grutter. I've been wanting to tell you how splendid Edward was through this terrible time. He's a hero. He's a saint. Even I was surprised. I hope you will be very happy, Miss Jones. Oh, I know I shall. 
And you'll never guess where we're going for our honeymoon. Java? No. If you'll lend us the launch, we shall go to that island where we were marooned. It has very tender recollections for both of us. It was there that I guessed how fine and good Edward was. It is there that I shall let Edward begin his new life. Eh? Mr. Gruter caught his breath. He left quickly, for he thought that unless he had a bottle of beer at once, he would have a fit. He was never so shocked in his life. Escape has brought you Somerset Mom's The Vessel of Wrath. Direction and adaptation of the story were by Anthony Ellis. In order of their appearance, you have heard Ben Wright as the narrator, Parley Bear as Mr. Gruter, Eric Snowden as Mr. Jones, Alan Reed as Ginger Ted, Jeanette Nolan as Miss Jones, and Dave Young as the head boatman. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are on a planet of desolation and utter ruin, awaiting the return of your comrades to carry you to safety. While about you, the crawling and evil remains of life are slowly hemming you in and ruthlessly tracking you down to your death. So listen next week when Escape brings you Charlie Smith's unusual story, North of Polaris. Tomorrow night on CBS Radio, here concluded Suspense's production of Shakespeare's tragic drama, Othello. Richard Widmark plays Iago, Elliot Lewis, Othello, and Kathy Lewis, Desdemona. Also tomorrow night, don't miss the Lux Radio Theater's charming excursion into fantasy, The Bishop's Wife, starring Cary Grant and Phyllis Thaxter. Othello concluded on Suspense and The Bishop's Wife on Lux Radio Theater tomorrow night and most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, America buys 30,000 new radio sets a day and listens most to the CBS Radio Network. I've still got a lot more planned for tonight's Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Coming up, it's The Man Without a Face from 5 After the Hour. It was originally broadcast on February 23, 1945. Also coming up, Dang Tan Nuck is a well-known con man who has used the names of multiple dead soldiers to con veteran groups into giving him money. One identity that he stole created a fascinating but dark story. We'll have that for you after the first half of Five After the Hour, coming up next. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, Please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. After the Hour by Les Weinrod.
it is five after the hour. Play the theme song, Mr. Conductor. Play it sweet, play it smooth. Make music a man can whistle. Thank you. A theme song is composed for you, listener. Fashion so that you can settle yourself comfortably near your radio. Designed for your ease in listening. Require time for comfort and ease. 50 seconds. by the man without a face. Now, have gone. I must think this out very carefully. I must decide what to say before they return to kill me. It is so difficult to think now. Think, man, think. Your future, your life depends upon it. (laughs) Your future, your life. Do you not remember the day you died? Him, or was it 11 years ago? I was at home, getting ready to attend the meeting of the bakers. Now, Liebchen, my cat. Here it is, dear. My, you do look handsome. Do you like it worn straight or cocked over the eye, so? Very jauntily. That way. And you shan't be late, shall you? Oh, no, no. When the Munich Baker's Guild meets for an evening of beer drinking, singing, marching, who can say any hour is late? <laughs> <laughs> excellent evening. Oh, excellent. Such scenes, such mugs. Hey, it was good. And the beer? <laughs> Wunderbar. What more pleasant a life could a man desire? Good friends, good companionship, laughter, music, and marching to Sturman. Right, <laughs> absolutely right. How easily you are both content. Well, why should we not be content? Why, indeed? Germany lies bleeding, disgraced by the terms of Versailles, sold out by the capitalists and the communists and the Jews, and you are content to wear those foolish uniforms and sing sentimental songs. You, you have no purpose in life. What greater purpose can one have than to raise a fine family, have a successful bakery, and belong to a club? Yes, whatever are you talking about? Blind, blind thought of you. History is being written around you, and you have not the eyes to see. Germany's destiny is being planned, and you have not the sense to understand. He has come to lead Germany, to redeem Germany. He will be our savior. <laughs> I should have sensed it then. I should have recognized it as a disease. A disease that would spread over all Germany. A disease from which the German soul would shrivel and wither and eventually die. Now I remember my friend's face as he spat out those words. There was hate there in his eyes. Hate and fanaticism and cruelty and lust. There was greed for power. There was everything a human should be frightened of. But I did not see it. Perhaps it was dark that night. Perhaps the beer blurred my vision. Perhaps it was because this fastica was then only a hooked cross in a red field. And a fear was then only a politician 
who spoke very loudly and made us feel that we should conquer the world through bluff and bluster. So I returned to my home and hung up my uniform of the baker skill and went about baking the lightest fun kuchen in all Munich. Doom cop sack! How many times have I told you you do not pull the trays out yet? I'm sorry, Master. I did not mean to be so careless. He did not mean to be so careless. For an excuse like that, an apprentice receives a reward like this. Oh! Now, perhaps you will remember the exact moment one pulls the trays out from the oven. Now, perhaps... And who dares to open the door without my permission? Who dares... Not with us. Immediately. What your talk is this? What do you mean by the... Oh. Pick him up. Take the boy, too. He has seen. This is the baker, Herr Doctor. Heil Hitler. Yeah, it's Hmm. The physical characteristics are as described. Nose, it... Yeah. However, we will try. His ancestry has, of course, been thoroughly checked. Five generations here in Munich. Aryan to the last drop of blood. Yeah, good. And now, tell me, Decker, are you prepared to shed a few drops of your pure Aryan blood in the course of the Third Reich? I may... It is permitted that I speak? To answer questions, yeah. But why have I been brought here? My family... Your family is safe for the moment. They are in protective custody. But why... Take him away. They are ready for him in the operating room. The operating room. Many surgeons. Oh, they examined me. The measurements of my face. Then the anesthetic and the operation. Weeks, many weeks in the room. Never being spoken to. Strapped to the bed. My face a hideous torment. Burning, itching, hurting. Then, that day. But we shall find out soon. Yeah. And now, we shall see the results of your surgery. I pray I have been successful. If you have, your work is over. Mine begins. We have come to remove the bandages. It will not be painful. Thank you. So, we begin. When we are finished, we shall have a surprise for you. Eh, hey, Doctor? But see better work. Of course. My apologies. There. Now, to remove this last bandage. So. Ah. Yeah. Incredible. This work I shall enjoy. Well, Echo, are you not curious? I, uh, I do not know what to say. Good. Continue so, and you will prosper. <laughs> With such a face, how can you help but prosper? Such a face? Yeah. Here. Take a smear. No. Look at yourself. <laughs> oh, no. I... I must deny. Oh. He has fainted from the shock. <laughs> yeah. Understandable. Would not you faint if you awakened and found you had the face of Adolf Hitler? We'll have the second half of Five After the Hour coming up in just a moment 
after the strange return of Master Sergeant John Hartley Robertson. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. In Washington, D.C., there are two walls that, from far enough away, appear to be black slabs. As you come closer, you start to notice the etchings on the walls. Closer still, and you will see that the etchings are names. In total, there are 58,308 names, each one belonging to an American man or woman who lost their life in the Vietnam War. Most of these lost souls return home to be buried, but far too many, some who died but were never found, others who were taken as POWs, etc., never came back. For the families of these missing 1,200 people, there is a hole that will never be filled, a hole created by uncertainty, by fear, by grief. To this day, there are mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, hoping for a miracle, hoping that their loved one will return, and with each passing year, the chances of that miracle happening shrinks. For the family of Master Sergeant John Hartley Robertson, that miracle happened in 2013, no matter what the world tells them. John Robertson was 32 when the helicopter he was in was shot down over Laos in May 1968. The copter carrying Robertson was never recovered, and in 1976, he and the other passengers were declared dead. In 1982, Robertson, along with his brothers-in-arms, had his name etched into the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall. He can be found on panel 64E, row 8. At the same time as the memorial was opened to the public, the U.S. government received reports that Robertson was alive. Robertson's wife and children weren't told. Tom Fonts never had an easy life. Born in Detroit, Fonts's father died when he was young, and while Fonts never liked to speak about it, his children believed that their grandfather perished in a house fire. After the death of his father, Fonts spent a life in and out of orphanages and detention centers suffering abuses he preferred to keep to himself. When the chance came, Fonts joined the U.S. Army and spent 27 months in Vietnam. His time in the military gave Fonts something he'd been missing – a family. After the war, Fonts became a born-again Christian and chose to live his life by a simple but honorable credo – radical love, no one left behind, no one left unloved. Fonts spent his life traveling the world on humanitarian missions, doing his best to ease the suffering of others. In 2008, Fonts was on a humanitarian mission in Vietnam 
when he heard about John Robertson, the American soldier who had been living in a small village. Fonts set out to the village to find Robertson. Robertson was old and he had all but forgotten how to speak English. He sat with Fonts and explained what happened in May 1968. His copter was en route to a rescue mission when it was shot down over some mountains. Robertson survived the crash but was instantly taken captive by North Vietnamese soldiers. For four years, they kept Robertson caged up, beating and starving him. At first, they tortured Robertson in hopes of gaining information from him, but in time, the torture just became something to pass the time. When he saw his chance, Robertson escaped from his cage and ran. He evaded the soldiers that pursued him and broke out of the forest before collapsing into a field where he was found by a woman he would later marry and have four children with. For reasons unknown, Robertson never tried to contact his family in America. For over 40 years, John Hartley Robertson lived with his new wife and children under the name of his new wife's dead husband, Dang Tan Nuk. Fonts pushed Robertson, now in his 70s, for more information. He wasn't about to blindly trust the man, but he hoped, deep in his heart, that what he was being told was the truth. Robertson was clear on some details, but other things, like when he was born or the names of his American children, he couldn't remember. He was suffering from dementia and would often break down in tears. Fonts, with the help of Emmy-winning documentarian Michael Jorgensen, searched for more information on Robertson. They found that the U.S. government has been contacted by Robertson multiple times, but they never informed his family. Robertson first contacted the U.S. military in 2006 to tell them that he was alive. In the information he filled out, Robertson wrote down the name of a non-existent high school and the wrong address for his U.S. home. He also misspelled his own name. Robertson tried again in 2008, and this time he was taken to the U.S. Embassy in Phnom Penh where he was fingerprinted. His prints did not match the ones on file. As far as the U.S. government was concerned, this was another case of a Vietnamese man trying to trick the military into giving him the back pay that John Robertson would be owed. Tom Fonts wasn't so ready to call Robertson a liar, though. His belief is that the U.S. authorities are working to keep Robertson and other living U.S. MIA POWs in Vietnam silent, though the reason to do so is unclear. Fonts and Jorgensen took Robertson to Edmonton, Canada to meet his only living sister, Jean Robertson Hawley. After a brief moment, Jean was sure the man standing before her was her brother back from the dead. Jorgensen turned the story into a documentary titled Undocumented in 2013. Shortly after the premiere, U.S. authorities released new information on Robertson. In 1991, former CIA paramilitary operations officer Billy Waugh traveled to Vietnam to find Robertson and obtain a DNA sample for testing. Waugh was successful, and the test proved that Robertson had not taken the name Dang Tang Nok from a dead man. He was Dang Tan Nok. How Dang Tan Nok, a Vietnamese citizen of French origin, had found the name of Master Sergeant John Hartley Robertson, or why he chose it, is unknown. What is known is that Dang Tang Nok is a well-known con man who has used the names of multiple dead soldiers to con veterans groups into giving him money. Wall believed that Nok had collected thousands of dollars over the year. Still, Master Sergeant Robertson's family held out hope. In November of 2013, they started a GoFundMe campaign in hopes to get the money needed to perform their own DNA test. While they were unable to reach the intended goal, the Robertson family was able to get the test done. The results showed that Wall had found over 20 years earlier, Dang Tan Nok was not John Hartley Robertson. Men like Dang Tan Nok, men who take advantage of the grieving and the hopeful are true monsters who walk the earth every day. To lose a family member to a war can be nothing less than shattering to one's soul. To lose them again because of the actions of a con man is something no one should ever have to feel. The want to believe that your loved one is alive and well overtakes the rational side of your mind 
pushing out all doubts because in the end, all any of us want is a happy ending. To find out more about MIA or POWs that are still missing and to donate to those families who are still living with uncertainty about their loved one who fought in Vietnam, you can visit pow-miafamilies.org. That's pow-miafamilies.org. In a few minutes, a woman comes home to find her visiting sister murdered, and police are convinced she was the one who committed the crime. So what went wrong with the case to allow her to get away with it? That story is coming up after we finish our story of Five After the Hour and Man Without a Face up next. The town is standard, a small Midwestern town where nothing ever happens. Quiet, peaceful, and tucked away among the cornfields and away from the dangers of the outside world. Unfortunately, there is nothing normal about Standard. There has been an evil that has been awakened, and now the residents are slowly going crazy. Men for no reason are coming home and murdering their families, and dark forms are appearing in people's mirrors. The evil is spreading, and now it's up to ex-Chicago cop Rob Aletto to find it. Time is running out, and the neighbors are becoming quiet shadows as they watch him. He doesn't have long before it'll start to get into his mind, and then he himself would be making that deadly trip home. Inside the Mirrors by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. We now return to Five After the Hour from May 23, 1945 and Man Without a Face on Weird Darkness Retro Radio. of Adolf Hitler. My face. What a fantastic thing. My reason tottered. I was certain I'd gone mad. Then the little Herr Doctor, he of the club foot, came again to my room. With him was the plain man I was to learn to fear. The one with the thin mouth and the nose glass. You are to be given the most glorious opportunity. The opportunity of laying down your life or your fear. My men of the Gestapo and Schutzstaffel will of course give you every protection. Needless to say, you'll be watched at all times. You will do nothing unless ordered. Is that clear? I understand. To your person, the Führer will be spared many taxing moments. His person will be reserved for only the most important activities. And now, your course of instruction will begin. Direct. Shoulders back. Left hand looped on the belt. Yeah, yeah. Better. Now, now the eyes flash. The head is thrown back. The right arm upraised in salute. Step left. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. No, 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 no. Not like everything. Like a liar. Again. But, oh dear, Doctor, I cannot much, though I try. Yeah, enough. Take him back into the room with the recording equipment for the rest of the day. We have been lied to and betrayed by the capitalists, the communists, and the Jews. 
England has grown fat off the meat of our bones. Russia lies waiting to pick those bones. And the Jews, like the jackals they are, stand ready to eat the remains. Germans arise! This is Belogan and Vendrogan water! It is of no further use. He will never be able to emulate the Fjord's voice. Then we will dispose of him. No, no. Much effort has been expended on him. He will do for routine matters. Mass demonstrations, parades, various inspections where the Fjord is not expected to speak. You follow? Oh, yes. And for all functions where there is the slightest degree of danger. That was why I was spared. There were others with faces like mine who could do the speaking on occasion. I learned of them quite by accident, and I kept the knowledge to myself. At first I was afraid, and then I was no longer fearful. People looked at me and cheered. People looked at me and trembled. There were even those who knew I was not what I seemed to be, but they were respectful. After all, one does not know what will happen. Yes, I liked it. I felt the power, the glory of leadership. Julius Fiedel, the youth of Germany welcomes you. In your thoughts we find our inspiration. In your deeds we find our ambitions. In your hopes we find our goal. We are you and you are Germany. Hanito! Yes, one must live the fear of friendship to appreciate it. I thought of nothing else. Now I wore my uniform more and more, even as he did. But I resented having only the one uniform. I wished he would wear many, like the fat one did. I learned much of what transpired in the party, too. The hatred, the jealousies. But one thing above all others I learned, that to conquer the world, one must follow blindly. You will leave at once for Munich. At once? He is there. He is not well. The cares of state weigh heavily on him. Various diplomats are expected. You will be seen in his study while he is resting. You will also abstain from any other activities. As you command, sir. In the event you do not completely understand me, may I point out that the various ways in which you entertain yourself are known to us. Yeah, my dear. That is all. Save one thing. Your situation is one from which there is no resigning. Also, if you are found wanting, there will be no other situation. Munich, the Brenner Pass, Berkes Garden, always with honor, with respect. Dachau, Belsen, Nordhausen. Gardelegen, the concentration camps. How the guards outdid themselves to entertain me, and how the inferior race and the political prisoners trembled as word passed through that I was there. The power and the glory of might. Then the blood purge of June 1934. <laughs> I was fearful at first, but it was soon over, and I was safe again. I was more powerful than ever. Then, the entrance into Austria in 1938, Anschluss, the fools, we would show them. In 1939, Czechoslovakia. A few days later, Lithuania. 
and hold on. Let's have all in time. And it was good. Oh, it's good. Man is intended to battle, and the German is in destined to rule. Germany must have Lebensraum. And the Lebensraum she must have is a whole world. France has capitulated, and Marshal Verdun has agreed to terms of surrender. The Fuhrer is now on his way to Paris. <laughs> danced a jig when France fell. He danced a jig after I had gone forward to try out the surroundings. But I had no fear. There was no one who could stand up to us. No one could question our mind. Then something happened. The astrologers and the mystics came more often to the Reich's chancery. He spent more and more time with them, and less and less time with the staff of the high command. The Russian campaign. He promised it would be a great adventure. It was no adventure. Japan struck at America. The American issue force declared war. And then the fat-bellied one proved a liar. He had promised us his Luftwaffe would drive from the skies anyone who dared rise up against it. He lied. I was near Hamburg. Come, sir. We must evacuate at once. The celebration that was planned, it is cancelled. The Wehrmacht has made a strategic retreat on the Russian front. Our forces have fallen back in good order, and the High Command has prepared a trap that will ensnare the recklessly advancing Soviets. For the national security, greater restrictions will be made on the home front. All citizens of the Reich will register with the proper authorities at once. Today, I knew it was the end. The Russians were at the very gates of Berlin. The Americans and the British were in the skies over Berlin. And I was in Berlin, in the secret sub-basement of the Reich's Chancellery, with him, with a little club-footed man. The Herr Doctor had just announced over the radio that he would fight with the citizens of Berlin to the end. Now I hated him. He had betrayed us. He had promised us a world and had led us into this hell. And then I heard them talking. I heard them. You have your orders? I understand. He will leave by plane. The other one will die here. But I did not want to die. I wanted to live. I had done nothing wrong. He had betrayed us all. He had promised us victory. You cannot kill me, my wife, my children. I will go back to Munich, my bakery. You cannot do... I must think, plan. They will come back. The Russians. They will think I am him. They will... This one. We dug him out of the sub-basement of the Reich's Chancellor, Tavaris Doctor. Mm. A good Nazi party member, no doubt. What is left of him, his face you see gone completely. Mm. 
No identification. Fingerprints were checked. He is no one. Pulse. Very weak. Will he live? Who knows? Tell me, doctor. If such a one survives, is there a possibility for plastic surgery? Impossibly. Let me see. In my guess, brown hair, weak mouth, pronounced nose. Typical Aryan, eh? Is it your guess they will make him a new face, doctor? I rather think no. The young, them the world can repair. Their faces, their minds, their hearts, their souls. For them, there is hope in the brotherhood of man. For this one and the others like him, these we shall leave without faces, even as Germany is today. These have lost the right to new faces. These have lost the right to the brotherhood of man. This one and the others like him must go on until he dies, a man without the face. have been listening to The Man Without a Face, written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrod. Five After the Hour originated in the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Up next, it's the weird darkness story about a woman who comes home to find her visiting sister murdered, and the police are convinced she did it, yet somehow she gets away with it. Did Ida do it? We'll find out. And then it's a classic tale from Edgar Allan Poe on Hall of Fantasy, The Telltale Heart, coming up. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marler. It's full of the strange and macabre, as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marler on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marler. Mrs. Ida Quinlan and her nine-year-old son Johnny went out to buy a pair of stockings around nine o'clock the night of February 1, 1896, leaving her baby in the care of her sister, Mrs. Sophia Grant. They took a streetcar to the store, several miles away, purchased the stockings and other sundry items, returning to the house at around eleven. Ida rang the bell, but there was no response, so she went to the landlord who lived nearby and got a key to the house. Entering the sitting room, she was surprised to see the drawers of the chiffoniers pulled out and the contents spread on the floor. She called for Sophia and, getting no response, went into the kitchen, where she found her sister lying dead on the floor, covered with blood. Horrified, Ida ran from the house to seek assistance from the neighbors. At least that was the story she told the police. The following day, Ida Quinlan was arrested for the murder of her own sister. They lived in a three-story tenement in the Charlestown section of Boston. It was a two-family home, but at the time Ida Quinlan and the two children shared the house with her sister Sophia Grant and their brother Angus McLeod, a conductor on the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. They also took in lodgers. John Thompson, a brake man on the same line as Angus, had a room there. Sophia had married B.W. Grand three years earlier, but after a few months they decided that they did not want to live together. She stayed in Charlestown, and he lived in Providence, Rhode Island, where he had a dry goods business. It was said Sophia and her husband were on friendly terms and corresponded frequently. Dr. O'Brien examined the body for the police and determined Sophia Grand had been struck in the head several times with a blunt object. 
fracturing her skull. She was wearing nothing but a nightdress and stockings, but had not been sexually assaulted. There were no signs of a struggle, but a rocking chair in the kitchen was overturned. She was probably struck while sitting in it. Robbery was thought to be the motive, but no one from the house could say that anything was missing. Ida thought Sophia kept $25 in one of the drawers, but that could not be confirmed. The doors had been locked when Ida returned, and there were no signs of a forced entry. It could have been one of the residents of the house, but everyone with a latch key had an alibi. It might have been a former lodger who kept his key, or possibly the killer had climbed a drain pipe and entered through a broken window on the third floor. But the police did not think it was necessary to go so far afield. Ida Quinlan's story did not stand up to close scrutiny. The police had several reasons to suspect Ida of the murder. She had a record of violence having been charged with assault and battery three months earlier. Ida's husband David had moved out due to her bad temper and drinking habits. She was the last to see the murdered woman and the first to find her dead. She could not explain why she left the house after 9 o'clock and traveled so far to make a purchase that she could have made at a store near her home. It was unusual for her to keep her nine-year-old boy out past 11. After finding the body, she ran from the house without first checking on her baby. Their guard dog, a large black Newfoundland named Fred, gave no indication of being disturbed by an intruder. The police were convinced that Ida Quinlan was guilty and arrested her for the murder of her sister. Additional evidence was gathered. Dr. Wood of Harvard University, who did forensic analysis for the police, examined the dress Ida wore and found blood, not in blotches which might have resulted from touching the body after death, but small spots as if spattered. Her Macintosh, shirtwaist, and shoes also had spots of blood. Nine-year-old Johnny Quinlan, when questioned, said he'd been by his mother's side all night, but the police found witnesses who contradicted that. At 9 o'clock, a delivery man came by with a dozen bottles of beer Ida had ordered. Normally, he would have carried them upstairs for her, but this time Ida carried them herself. While she was inside, William D. Daughtry, a tailor on his way to the shop, saw a boy standing alone on the street. He recognized him as Johnny Quinlan and said hello. Ida and Johnny had been seen apart long enough for her to have murdered Sophia. The biggest problem for the police was the absence of a motive for the murder. Relations between Ida and Sophia were cordial. There were no recent arguments or long-standing feuds between them. It was said that they disagreed on religious matters, but not enough to incur violence. Ida would not benefit financially by her sister's death. There appeared to be no reason for Ida to kill her sister. In spite of this, the police were ready to take their case to the grand jury. Without a motive, it was doubtful that Ida would be indicted for first-degree murder, but the police were sure that she'd be charged with second-degree murder or at least manslaughter. But the grand jury was not impressed by the evidence against Ida Quinlan and did not return any indictment. While they vowed to keep investigating, the police were reluctant to pursue any other theory. They had gone all in against Ida Quinlan, and they still believed she was guilty. Their reputation as officers rests on their claim, said the Boston Daily Advertiser, and it could not be said that they would attempt to pass over any other clue, yet it can easily be seen that it would be very hard for them to get up much enthusiasm in working over something that would be a slap in their own faces. The Boston police found no more evidence against Ida Quinlan or anyone else in the case. The murder, which made sensational headlines in February, was all but forgotten in March. A bordello, pizza, and a haunting. You can find them all at the Red Onion Saloon. I'll tell you about that here in just a few minutes when we take our mid-story break from Hall of Fantasy and the Telltale Heart beginning right now from June 1st, 1953 on Weird Darkness Retro Radio. And now... 
the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Telltale Heart. I had nothing against the man. I didn't want his money. And those who say I did are crazy. He was always agreeable and liked me. But there was one thing about him that bothered me. That I, that I of his, that pale blue vulture eye. Why did you do it? (laughs) That, that voice. It's always with me. It's always with me. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Listen. Can't you hear it? So rhythmic, beating, beating. It's with me. It follows me wherever I go. The pounding of his heart. The pounding, beating rhythm of the telltale heart. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Telltale Heart. And now for our story. Adapted for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Telltale Heart. Yes? Uh, There was an advertisement in the paper. I'm here to answer it. I see. Won't you come in, please? Yes, thank you. Are you the one I'm supposed to see? No, I'm Mrs. Gorman, the housekeeper. Mr. Lawrence, the old gentleman, he's the one you ought to see. You'll just wait here. I'll tell him you're here. Yes, thank you, of course. Mr. Lawrence? Yes? Someone here and asked for the advertisement you placed in the paper. Uh, Send him in, Mrs. Gorman. Sir, Mr. Lawrence will see you now. Thank you. He's over by the desk, sir. Yes, ma'am, I see him. Thank you. You come in answer to the advertisement in the paper? Yes, sir. You care to sit down? No. No, I'll stand, thank you. What's your name? Uh, Crowther. David Crowther. Aside from my housekeeper, Mr. Crowther, I live here by myself. I feel the need of a companion. Someone to whom I can talk. Mrs. Gorman is a housekeeper. She doesn't talk very much. Very competent person, but very uncommunicative. You have references, I suppose? No, Mr. Lawrence, I I haven't. Oh. Uh, what work have you been doing? I'll be completely honest with you, Mr. Lawrence. I I haven't been working for the past year. I was only released from the hospital two weeks ago. I noticed you looked rather pale. Are you well now? Oh, yes. I've completely recovered. Well, uh, you don't have references. I don't know. Uh, please, Mr. Lawrence... I need employment. My money is all gone, and I must work in order to live. I see. What about your family? I have no family. No other attachments? No, sir. I'm going to take a chance on you, Mr. Crowther. Thank you, sir. Of course, your salary won't be too large. But you'll have a roof over your head and plenty of food to eat. When can you start? Tonight, if you like, Mr. Lawrence. Excellent. You know, Mr. Crowther, David, if I may call you that. Yes, sir. I have the feeling that we're going to get along quite well together. I was with him for several months. I don't know when the idea first entered my mind. But once it was there, it haunted me day and night. It enveloped my brain with its cunning. I had nothing against the man. He was always agreeable and liked me. But there was one thing about him that bothered me. That I, that I of his... One day I asked the housekeeper about it. Mrs. Gorman. Yes, David? Uh, the old gentleman. One of his eyes. Is there anything wrong with it? Well, I don't think so, David. I, I hadn't noticed. To me, one of his eyes resembles that of a 
vulture. Pale blue it is with a cloudy film covering it. It didn't bother me at first. and well, In fact, it doesn't bother me now unless he looks at me, but... Unless he looks at you? Why? Well, every time he looks at me, my blood runs cold. That pale blue vulture eye... I think I... you're imagining things, David. <laughs> Yes, yes, Mrs. Gorman. Per perhaps I am imagining things. You won't say anything about it to Mr. Lawrence, will you? Of course not, David. <laughs> I don't know what came over me. Of course, there's nothing wrong with the old gentleman. Nothing at all. <laughs> yes, but there was. That eye of his. That pale blue vulture eye. Little by little, I began to hate him with all my heart. One evening, a few weeks later, the old man and I sat in the living room. We had just finished dinner and were talking as we usually did. <laughs> just as you say, Mr. Lawrence, we'll have to wait and... And, well, what are you looking at? What, David? Are you staring at me? No, of course not. Yes, you are. Don't look at me like that. I'm not looking... Don't look at me! Turn it away. Turn it away. Turn your eye away. David. What's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong with me. On your eye. It's like a vulture's. A few days passed. And I guess he thought I had forgotten about his eye. <laughs> but I hadn't. No, I hadn't. And every night about midnight... I'd get out of bed, creep from my room to his. I'd unlatch the door and open it. And then, after it was opened wide enough to stick my head through, I would put in a covered lantern all closed so that no light would shine forth. <laughs> and after I had my head in the room, I would undo the lantern so that only... Single ray of light darted out. And I would shine it on his face to see if his eye were open. But no, it never was. Not then. I found the eye always closed. And you see, that made it impossible to do my work. For it wasn't the old man that bothered me, but his eye. His evil eye. Unless his eye were open, I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I knew that one night it would happen. Yes, it would open, and then I could do it. Then I could kill him. <laughs> Back now to our story, adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Telltale Heart. <laughs> And so I waited. I went out of my way to make him comfortable. I made sure that I never mentioned anything about his eye to him. And every morning I would go into his chamber boldly and ask him, Well, Mr. Lawrence, did you sleep well last night? Why, uh, yes, David, I did. You didn't hear anything? Uh, any noises? No, not a one. I'm glad of that. Why? Did you hear anything? No, 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 not a thing. And why did you ask me if I had? Oh, I was just asking, Mr. Lawrence. I wanted to make sure. I wanted to make sure. And he thought everything was all right. He was a fool. Just like all the others. <laughs> For how could he know? Yes, how could he know that every night on the stroke of twelve, I looked in upon him as he slept. <laughs> You know, David, I didn't sleep very well last night. You didn't, Mr. Lawrence? No, I had a bad dream. Oh? What did you dream about? I dreamt that someone was looking in at me while I slept. Just waiting for a chance to kill me. Well, that's just a dream, Mr. Lawrence. Nothing to worry about, you know that. Yes, I... I guess it was just a dream. <laughs> because the only people here are Mrs. Gorman, myself, and... Neither one of us would hurt you. You know that, don't you, Mr. Lawrence? Yes. I'm glad you're both with me, David. They're just the same. I can't seem to get rid of that feeling. It 
frightens me. Don't worry about a thing, Mr. Lawrence. No, don't worry. I'll take care of you. On the eighth and last night, I took special pains to make sure he wouldn't hear me. A watch's minute hand moved more quickly than did mine. I crept out into the hallway, made my way to his door. His room was all black, black as coal, black as midnight. I think he heard me, but I knew he couldn't see a thing. <laughs> the room was too dark for that. I was almost in the room and about to open my lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man was immediately fully awake. He sat upright in bed and whispered, Who's there? He said, Who's there? I kept still. I didn't say a thing. No, not a thing. And for what seemed like an hour, I stood there and didn't move a muscle. I knew he wouldn't lie down. He was sitting up in his bed, listening. Listening for what it was that had made the noise. <laughs> the old man was in mortal fear. When I had waited a long time... And still had not heard him lie back upon his bed. I resolved to open my lantern a little. Yes, just a little. Just the tiniest bit. And presently, the tiniest bit of light struggled out. I directed it towards him like the thread of a spider. And finally, it came to rest upon his vulture eye. And then... I seemed to hear something. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't distinguish it at first, and I racked my mind to think of what it was. And then finally it came to me. Yes, that was it. It was the beating of the old man's heart. Who is in here? I could hear it distinctly. He was so afraid. Beat, 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 beat. It went. I could feel its rhythm. The old man was in mortal terror. But I held the lantern motionless. I tried to keep the beam of the light focused on that terrible eye, that pale blue vulture's eye. The incessant drumbeat of his heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker. Beat, beat, beat. Louder, louder every moment. The old man's terror must have been extreme. Then that, I thought of something else. The sound of his heart was so loud it might be heard by someone else, by Mrs. Gorman, by some prying neighbor. And I couldn't allow that, could I? No. And the beating grew louder and louder and louder until I could stand it no longer. Who's there? Don't be afraid, old man. Is that you, David? Yes, that's right. It's only me. Nothing to be afraid of. What are you doing in my room? Just watching over you, Mr. Lawrence. I thought it was someone else. You have nothing to fear from me, old man. But you should be asleep. Oh, <laughs> I'll go to sleep. And so will you, old man. So will you. David, what's wrong with you? Nothing. Nothing, old man. Nothing at all. Don't come any closer to me. Stay away from me. Die, old man. Die. That's your heart. Die with you. Die. Die. Close your eye. That vulture eye. Close it forever. <laughs> stood there in the darkness, looking down upon him. He was quiet now. Strange kind of stillness was upon him. <laughs> For he was dead. His eye would trouble me no longer, and I knew that I had to dispose of the body, and I racked my brain to think of a place, and then it came to me. Yes, I pulled three boards from the floor. I had to work quickly. The blackest of night was fast changing to gray. I placed his body under the flooring very neatly, and then I boarded it up again. <laughs> I did it so well that even I could hardly recognize the spot under which the body was hidden. Yes, his room looked as if nothing had happened. The striking of the town clock made me realize how late it was. Well, the job was over, and no one would ever be the wiser. <gasps> Who's there? Mrs. Gorman. Uh, just a moment. 
Yes. Yes, what is it? Where's Mr. Lawrence? He's not here. Not here? No, no, he... He went out to the country late this evening. I heard something up here. Such as... A scream. No one screamed, Mrs. Gorman. I, I guess I was mistaken. I'll have to send them back then. Who? I was afraid when I woke up I heard or... Or I thought I heard a scream. You didn't hear a thing. Mr. Lawrence has been gone for some time. What are you doing up here? I wanted to make sure he hadn't forgotten anything. What you probably heard, Mrs. Gorman, was the neigh of the horse as the carriage carried Mr. Lawrence away. Then I... I must tell him to go. Who? Who's downstairs? Who is it? Well, I... I was frightened. I called the police. Huh. They're waiting for you downstairs. For both you and Mr. Lawrence. <laughs> In the small city of Skagway, Alaska, on Broadway Street, there is a building built with planks cut by the town's founder, Captain William Moore. This building is interesting for three reasons – a bit of naughty history, pizza, and a haunting. The naughty history of the building began just after its completion when it opened as a bordello in 1898 called the Red Onion Saloon. This was during the gold rush, when miners hoping to hit it big traveled through Skagway, which had been dubbed the Gateway to the Klondike, on their way to find gold nuggets. Miners would come in looking for entertainment in both drink and ladies, and they found both in the Red Onion Saloon. The first floor was a saloon where the men would imbibe alcohol and dance with the women. The second floor contained ten rooms where the men were entertained by the ladies who inhabited them. Choosing the ladies was done with dolls. Each had a doll that represented them behind the bar. If the dolls were sitting up, the lady that the doll represented was available. If the doll was lying on their back, they were entertaining. As time passed and the rush for gold faded from the area, the bordello eventually faded as well, leaving the building behind to become other things. It was used as barracks in World War II to house soldiers. It also became a union hall, bakery, and gift shop, as well as a laundry and television station. But its history as a bordello would not fade, and it was destined to become a saloon again. Only this time, there would be pizza. Today, it is a historical landmark and operates as a saloon and brothel-themed pizzeria with pizzas with bordello-themed names like the Busty LaRue or Lady Lavoie and the employees dress as madams from the Red Onion Saloon's heyday, as well as barmen and musicians in period dress from that time. It's also a working museum where they give tours and you can view items that were once in the brothel. Sounds like a fun place to visit, even without a ghost. The haunting itself is allegedly the ghost of a woman who had been named Lydia and is thought to have been a prostitute at the Red Onion Saloon during the Gold Rush. There have been multiple sightings of her, especially in the upstairs area. Though she has been allegedly hostile to men, she does have a fondness for plants in the saloon and waters them. There have been footsteps heard on the second floor, and if that doesn't frighten you, she also has appeared as a full-bodied apparition that ran down the hall when police came to check out a disturbance. She then ran into the madam's room. When they checked it, no one was in the room. It is often this room where her spirit is seen walking around and watering plants that are no longer there. There is often a strong smell of perfume and cold spots. Unfortunately, it's not known whether she died in the Red Onion Saloon, but one of the former madams was believed to be named Lydia, and perhaps it is her spirit that lingers. So if you want to do some ghost hunting on your own, the Red Onion Saloon operates from April to October. Get a drink, order a pizza, and if you're lucky, you'll also get to see Lydia. I'll be back in just a moment with the second half of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart on Hall of Fantasy.
No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. And now the second half of Edgar Allan Poe's The Tell-Tale Heart on Hall of Fantasy. Back now to our story, adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Tell-Tale Heart. I was so sure that no one had heard anything. But Mrs. Gorman, the housekeeper, she must have heard him scream. Or did she hear the beating of the old man's heart? I went downstairs with her. Crowther, officer. Thank you. Will you be needing me anymore? No, I don't think so. Good night, then. Well, what can I do for you, gentlemen? You'll have to pardon us, sir, for disturbing you. We received a complaint from your housekeeper about some strange noises she heard. Oh, she must be mistaken, officer. Nothing's happened here. The housekeeper said she heard a scream from upstairs. Oh, she must have been dreaming. Perhaps. But I hope you'll excuse us, sir, if we take a look through the house. Why, certainly, officer. I have nothing to hide. Uh, well, where do you want to start, gentlemen? If you'll just show us around. With pleasure. Just follow me. I led them from room to room. I took them all over the house. I wanted to show them I had nothing to hide. I showed them every nook and cranny in the uh, place except the old man's room. I wanted to say that to uh, laugh. <laughs> Finally, I took them into his room. And though they searched it exhaustively, they found nothing. I was quite pleased with myself. That housekeeper of yours must have imagined she heard a scream from up here. Probably just a nightmare. Well, perhaps what she heard was me. I, uh, yes, I had a nightmare, and I think it, well, I might have been the one she heard. Well, there you are. That's a simple explanation of it. <laughs> yeah, I, always, I often have nightmares. You know. We uh, ought to go to her room and tell your house. Don't worry about it, Tom. It wasn't her fault. Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, how would she know who made the noise? She said there was a, a Mr. Lawrence living here, too. Oh, yes. Where is he now? Well, he... He isn't here. Well, that's evident. But where is he? Well, he... He went out to the country for a few weeks. He left tonight. I see. Uh, sorry to have troubled you, sir. No trouble at all, officer. Well, let's get out of here, Ed. We're keeping this gentleman up. If you gentlemen won't think it presumptuous, uh, won't you have a glass of wine with me? I know how it is after you've been up all night. And... Oh, I don't know, sir. We're not supposed to drink while we're on duty. Ah, but, Ed, we're... Uh, we're almost through. Let's have a glass of wine. When we finish here, we can go home. Yes, yes, do have some wine. All right, it's a pleasure. All right, I'll get it for you. And Mr. Lawrence always kept a decanter and glasses on that table. Did you say kept, sir? <laughs> a slip of the tongue, officer. <laughs> the hour is late, you know. I uh, don't mind that, Mr. Crowther. He's suspicious of everybody. <laughs> yes, of course. Well, that's your job. Well, here we are. I hope you like sharing. Mm-hmm. Always have it at home. <laughs> Good. Glad to hear that. Well, here's yours, sir. Thank you. And yours. Thanks. There. Now, shall we drink to something, gentlemen? Well, let's drink to you, sir, as a sort of apology for interrupting your sleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's very good, you know. <laughs> you did interrupt me. <laughs> I wanted to show off. I had seated them in the old man's room. And after all, in a way, this was a celebration, a token of my ingenuity. I had seated myself on top of the very spot under which I had hidden the body. We had one glass of wine, then another, and another. We were talking quite freely when I... when I heard it. Oh, won't you gentlemen have enough... Uh, what's that? What's what, sir? That noise. That beating. I don't hear anything. Anything wrong, Mr. Crowther? No, nothing. Nothing's wrong. 
Have some more wine. I wish they'd leave. They were getting on my nerves. I had a terrible headache. And I seemed to hear a beating in my ears. They began to look at me queerly. And yet that sound increased. There was nothing I could do about it. It was a low, dull, quick sound. Like the beating of a drum. Where, where had I heard that sound before? They watched me closely. I paced the floor. I, I didn't know where the sound was coming from. Beep, beep, beep. Drop, beep, drop, drop. Where had I heard that sound before? I knew they suspected who wouldn't with that incessant beating that filled the room that seemed to make the very walls shake with its monotonous beat, that rhythm? Where had I heard it before? Where had I? I knew! I knew where I'd heard it before! Beat, drop! Beat, drop! Beat, beat, beat! Yes! I knew where I'd heard it before! It was the beating of the old man's heart! What's the matter, Mr. Crowther? Can't you hear it? Hear what, sir? Perhaps I can push it out. What's the matter with you? What are you trying to do? Stop it from beating! Stop what, sir? Get out of here. Both of you! Get out of here! But you... Get out of here! <laughs> Can't you hear it? Can't you? I can stifle his heart, that throbbing heart. Can't you hear the throbbing? Can't you hear it? The only thing we hear is you, Mr. Crowther. I can't stand it. I can't. The continuous pounding will never stop till I tell you the truth. The truth about what? About the old man, about Lawrence. I did it. I did it. What did you do? I killed him. Under the floor. The body is under the floor and he stopped that beating. <laughs> stop the beating of his guilty heart. <laughs> voice. It's always with me. Always with me. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Listen. Did you hear it? Slow, rhythmic beating. 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 It's with me. It follows me wherever I go. The pounding of its heart. The pounding. Pounding the beating, beating rhythm of his telltale heart. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. <laughs> All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Thanks for listening to Weird Darkness Retro Radio. If you haven't done so yet, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And if you like the show, please share it with someone you know who also loves old-time radio and stories of the creepy and macabre. All Weird Darkness stories are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories, authors, or sources in the episode notes and on the Weird Darkness website. Old-time radio shows are provided by the individual copyright holders with special permission from RadioArchives.com. And if you'd like to download free, full-length old-time radio shows as well as pulp audiobooks and ebooks, just send an email to WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com and you'll get an instant reply with information on how to do so. Again, it's absolutely free. That's WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar.
Thanks for joining me for Weird Darkness Retro Radio.